thirty. So let's uh, call this study session of the council to order on January twenty third, twenty twenty four. Um, we got three items on uh, the agenda tonight. We got a uh, continuing the economic development uh, roadshow here uh, every week. Here it seems uh, we get economic <laughs> development, community development update, and a uh, comprehensive economic development strategy, and then some talk about land use code. Thanks to uh, Mayor Pro Tem for filling in for me last week. Yeah, we just a he did times. a good job. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt my time driving back from Grand Junction is listening to the three hours. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to the city manager to kick off the first one, which is the update and overview of the economic development teams. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, good evening members of the council. We're uh, real pleased to have an opportunity to share with you an overview of community development, ec economic development tonight. Because I'd say there's more going on in this department right now than any other of our departments. And while our lar the departments that are yet larger, which would be pu police and public works, have such a focus on uh, maintaining and preserving the community we have, and you know the, the ongoing kind of um, care, again, for, for people here, community development is is really chiefly focused on the future and helping us craft and build our future and maintain and improve our economic engine uh, which you know as we all know is what will long term sustain our community and the opportunity to have all these services and everything else that we have so this department's had a lot of change over the past few years one of the most in impacted by covid New land use code, lots of changes. You'll hear a little, a little bit of that recap tonight. And uh, I think they've embraced those changes and have done a ton of work to kind of craft that bright future for us. So with that, I will turn it over to our interim community development and director slash ongoing economic development director, Cindy Perry, who will introduce the rest of our team and start our overview tonight. Yeah, well, thank you all for having us. Um, normally, these two departments would have individual updates, but with my temporary dual director role, you get the combo meal this year. Um, and I'll introduce the team as we kind of go along. I've incorporated that throughout the presentation, so I haven't forgot about you. Um, so this slide, in addition to sharing our love for Colorado beanie attire, um, breaks out responsibilities of the individual departments. Um, but both of these departments serve development and business services within the city. <clears throat> Community development also serves a critical role in public safety through both building services and code compliance. This is a more detailed organization um, of how the department is currently structured. And um, as Jim mentioned, we've, we've had a busy couple of years. So um, I'll talk about some accomplishments throughout the presentation, some challenges and some opportunities. So starting off with all the good stuff, um, the administrative staff has a unique role in that they support both community development and economic development. That's a rare situation. Um, administration is made up of 1.5 <clears throat> and we are so grateful for their work um, with day-to-day -day operations, and that includes work creating and managing the budget, paying the bills, um, they provide development review team support. Um, they lead our work plan development, ensure web updates are done, and um, are overseeing records management, um, which leads to the, the first bullet stat. So an interesting factoid is that community development's administrative staff process the lion's share of Colorado open records requests citywide. Was um, normally that's a public works uh, talking point, but, but we got that in 23. So um, to mitigate this workload impact, staff is working on a project to scan all department documents, which will make information more readily accessible via a self-serve serve option on the website. 
So we anticipate that this will minimize some of that staff work um, and provide the public with a more transparent and quick serve option. So they are not here tonight, but I wanted to thank Denise Arnia and Lori Jameson for their tireless work um, to support the two departments. And we also have two temp staff, Jennifer Daw and Terry Lito, that are um, helping to support us. So moving on to the building um, bullet. Oh, I'm gonna skip building. I'm actually gonna come back to building. I've got some, some interesting talking points on that. But for planning, 2023 was a year of firsts. Um, and these firsts are the culmination of code changes and ongoing process improvement. Um, we had the first rezone and future land use character map with the Embry multifamily project at the current Lumen site on Mineral and Broadway. We had the first application of a site plan for a multifamily project under the brand new inclusionary housing ordinance to build affordable units. And we had approval of a new local historically designated property in downtown. So a special shout out to the planning team led by Jared Chipman. And Jared is acting as the interim <coughs> manager. And he's supported by Terry Whitmore, Zareen Tasneem. I think they're back there. You can wait. Um, Andrea Vaughn and Jesse Sheets. So thanks to all of you for your planning expertise, um, helping me navigate through code changes and organizational changes, and a very high volume of work. I have to do two clicky things. So um, code compliance might be one of the lesser talked about programs, but one that has major impact in lots of ways. Um, I want to start by saying thank you to City Council for upgrading our one of our code officers from half time to full time. That's made a huge difference for us in how we attack compliance issues. So now we have two full-time officers and one working manager. So codes address safety or nuisance issues on private property. They serve as a connector to neighborhoods in partnership with local law enforcement and they work to keep our city clean and well maintained. And I think the photos on the slide are a great example of the impact that their work has on, on the city. Um, in 2023, our small and relatively new CODES team accomplished a lot with 346 cases, six property abatements, and six general cleanups. That was done with less than 2.5 staff within a six month period because they all started around mid-year. So they are not here tonight, but I want to um, express and, and make everybody aware of uh, our code compliance officers, Jenna Harker and Shay Gorman. They're both full of energy and have brought some really cool ideas with solutions forward. And we also have new leadership in our codes division uh, with the addition of our, our new manager, Jeremy Coventink. Jeremy uh, brings expertise in code language, program development, and process, which we desperately need. Cindy, on the picture on the left there, who did that work? Did we, did we sub that out or do? That's an, that, that was an abatement. Works? So okay. yeah, we, we took care of it. Okay. and build it back. Gotcha. Cindy, now that you've moved from one and a half to two, is there more proactive code compliance? And then there was, instead of just waiting for submissions or reports? Yeah. Yeah, um, I might be a, uh, somewhat able to answer that question. So one of the things that we're going to talk about after uh, a little later in the evening is our code updates. And one of those items is actually to the nuisance code. And so our, um, our code enforcement officers have been working with uh, planning and a number of other staff members on drafting some nuisance code updates, and that will better uh, allow them to be able to do more proactive work. So uh, at this point in time, it's been a little bit more of a reactive process with the goal and the ideal of moving that more towards proactive. So what, what are you thinking, Pam? Are you thinking 
Are they driving the neighborhoods and, and putting <clears throat> notices or, or <clears throat> warnings or I mean, something? I want like to stop every you know every block and go look at all that trash and you know you just have to get from point A to point B. To <laughs> Don't come on my street. Yeah, to, <laughs> that kind of stuff, graffiti. Yes. Yeah. I mean that the the new code manager that was one of the points in his interview is you know. Some cities will create districts or routes um, to proactively, or neighborhoods where they, they begin to know the HOAs, the, the apartments. Um, so that is definitely on the radar. Um, you know, and if you're out doing a citation and you notice that right next door we have a similar issue, of course, you know, let's let's take care of both of them. So so that is definitely um, on the list. Do we even have that list of HOAs yet? Um, we just talked about this. Uh, we, we met with Julie recently, um, and we're partnering on making sure that we have a list of homeowners associations, property management companies, and who the best contacts are. Because that's one of our biggest struggles is, you know, trying to reach the right person to take care of it. So we're working through that. Excellent. Um, let's see. Moving right along. Uh, economic development. So I think it's fair to say that 2022 was our year of ideas, and then 2023 was our year of getting stuff done. Um, so we launched, uh, relaunched the revitalization grant program, which had been dormant um, through parts of COVID. This program supports brick and mortar uh, businesses by providing, providing facade improvement grant dollars. Jamie Kraut has done an incredible job. Um, oops, I'm getting my clickers mixed up. <coughs> has done an incredible job updating and managing this program. Um, last year, the city issued $96,000 in grant funds, which generated private investment of just about 1.5 million. So that's a return on the city's investment of more than 14%, plus investment attracts investment um, so that's a great thing. Uh, the council recently heard our update on the recent retail and mixed use study. The findings from that study are going to be incorporated into our one year work plan and our broader economic development strategy, which you're going to hear more about in a little bit. We launched a shop local campaign app, which is gaining quite a lot of steam and interest from local businesses. We've had a couple of media spots on it, and now we're starting to get calls from other cities. So I want to thank Brian Garner for coming back, first of all. <laughs> I'm new here. <laughs> <laughs> and for regularly introducing ideas. Um, he's the one that brought this app to our attention. So he's always trying to find a cool new way to do something better in economic development. So, you know his ideas and then Jamie's execution has really um, added a lot to, to the work that, that we do. Um, we also kicked off a business focused newsletter. Um, and in these times uh, when there's so much competition for readers attention, you know, we're proud to note that our newsletter has a much higher than average open rate of 73% and the average is around 21%. So, that, to me, says we're sharing meaningful content. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, and finally, we are wrapping up the citywide economic development strategy, hopefully tonight. Um, so this is the super fun part of our job. Um, and economic development and community development overlap a lot. So we can't accomplish what we did last year without working together. Um, so this, this slide shows a list of pretty cool development projects that opened in 2023 and a growing list of projects coming in 24 and into 25. Not listed on this slide are about nine multifamily projects in the queue, which is both a huge accomplishment and a big lift. So it's going into Littleton Village. 
Um, we have a proposal for, well, we've got the Amley project, which will have ground floor retail. They'll create a Main Street feeling on Village Park Drive. Um, we have a new concept, which will be coming forward soon, number 38, um, which is a, a really kind of a hot commodity. So it's what the, what the, <laughs> What the locals have been asking for. So. Restaurant. It's a restaurant event. Oh, okay. restaurant, oh. restaurant. What was this, Steve? I'm so excited. You're so excited? Oh, okay. Dancing and okay. also music. Okay. Close by. Oh, my <laughs> best pointer <laughs> sisters. I can't keep it down. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's so we'll be coming trying to bring the energy. Littleton <laughs> yeah. Bill is just like that town of Footloose. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I got that reference. Don't worry. <laughs> so this exciting slide is um, just a partial representation of how our work rolls up to Council's two and three year priorities, those big outcomes on the left. Um, and, you know, we've got the strategies on the right, and, and there are metrics that are tied to these work plans, which just aren't really showing up on this particular slide. So, um, they, they say a picture, was it a picture? What is it? Says it's not worth, worth, it's worth, worth a oh, thank words. you. Pictures, I, I didn't even write my, a picture is worth a thousand words, but this one, not so much. <laughs> um, but, if, if you look behind these, you know, the pretty colored bars on the screen, there's a really important story. Um, so in late 2021, the city adopted the new land use code. That basically launched in 2022. If you look at permit valuations during that time period, and permit valuations are really how much investment is associated with the improvement that's being applied for. You see moderate growth in 2020, 2021. In 2022, which is when we started, you know, doing stuff with the new land use code, you start to see some life. Um, if you look at the cumulative permit value for those three years combined, it was about 387 million. And then all of a sudden in 23, that's just one year, the permit valuation is about 362 million, and a big chunk of that came in in quarter four. So in terms of raw numbers, the city has approximately 50% more permit activity in 22, or 52% more than that three-year average. So a little more, the, the permits are just in the system. So that means that they still need to go through the review and the inspection process. They're not all necessarily approved, yet some might be. Um, but what this means is that the planning, building, engineering staff is working on a heck of a lot more volume, uh, which I'll kind of talk about in just a minute. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embarrass Stephen back there. <laughs> so I want to... I want to recognize Stephen. Um, he stepped in as our interim uh, chief building <clears throat> official, all while doing a huge job of plans examiner, which means he's looking at all of this. Um, and, you know, we love Stephen, so we are in the process of recruiting another plans examiner. Again, thank you, Council, for approving that position. That's going to be a huge help to the department. We're also doing some cross-training to help Stephen, and then looking at, you know, potentially outsourcing some support. But all the while, Stephen has remained diligent, upbeat, and so, so calm. Um, and he's basically a machine, so, and never a complaint. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Stephen is supported by a pretty new but high-performing, optimistic, energetic inspection team made up of Greg Lang, Andrew Hassler, Whitney Brooks, and Zach Zimmett. Um, our permit center also deserves kudos for working on process improvement and holding down the fort, um, and they're led by Hope Jones. 
uh, supported by Amy Sains, Bernie Velasco, and Rob Carlstrom. Do I sound like, we were talking about the award shows. I'm starting to feel a little bit like that. Um, and I, I also want to call out Amy and Bernie because they, they took some extra initiative this year to become certified as bilingual interpreters for the city. So if somebody comes to the counter or anywhere in the city and they need that service, those two um, are, are able to support them with that service. Okay, so back to my regular programming here. So as I mentioned with that spike in workload, um, we're working on strategies, you know, to better manage that surge. Uh, again, that's gonna be through cross-training of internal staff, working with contractors, um, because this wave is going to continue into 24. Um, something else that this graph doesn't necessarily show is that the types of projects coming in have changed. So in those early years, there were residential, commercial, you know, kind of the smaller projects, maybe a remodel, maybe an addition. Um, but 23 brought new bills and more complex infill redevelopment. So that's mixed use and, and multifamily. A typical residential remodel or addition project might have two or 10 sheets with the design documents that got to be processed, plan reviewed, checked for compliance by inspectors. A new single family house has about 107 sheets. And a project like a 243 unit multifamily development and remember, we have about nine new of those guys coming through, may have nine to 10,000 sheets in their design documents. So in other words, more design means more work. Now, we're, we're super excited about these projects. I just, wanted, I just wanted to point that out in recognition of you know, the change and the impact on, on staff workload. We will get through it, I promise. Um, just a quick question on this, yeah. I know that's the, uh, the valuation is different because these bigger, more expensive projects and, you know, have a lot more. Yep. Home, I mean, since this is just permits, there's probably a, a handful or more than a handful of big projects that are going to be coming through in the next, this year. Yes. Add to that. I was just going to ask, is that a lot of this with the uh, roofs? I mean, I know that we had so many more roofs. I mean, they're probably smaller in value, but is that, are we going to see hopefully a drop next year? I guess you can never... Plan for hail. Yeah. Um, Stephen is here. I, I'm going to do my best, Stephen, to not mess this up. But I, I don't think this is this is roofs. Um, and I have a but listing of a portion of it. I assume is, or is it not? There is a yeah, yes. Yeah, we had. Saying, we I'm had not saying the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We had a significant increase of, of roofing um, this past year with with the hailstorms. So we've got uh, in 23 we had 10 single family. Um, 1129 multifamily and Stephen, do you know the answer to that? I'm sorry, I'm looking back to you. Um, on the number, of the impact is it how much roofs and what's making up the number? This it was in there somewhere, it was like 1400 or something, it was a lot, but we can come back if he wants to. I was just wondering if it'll yeah. come down a little bit because the roofs were so <laughs> big this year, or if some of the other big projects will continue that increase. Then, assuming some of those have a lot more value than a couple hundred roofs. Yeah, I think we only have seen several of our large projects actually come in for permits. So I do agree that as long as there is another large hail event or something else, that the hail numbers will dip a little. But I think we have more than enough large projects that um, it wouldn't surprise me if that number was similar size or higher. Just for instance, just to you know, I think 2023 does not include Evergreen or Toll. Um, it does not include the Lumen property. You know, many of the large projects that you're aware are coming are, are going to be 24 and 25 projects. So that you can think of those as scale for what's coming versus the pattern we'd seen prior to 2023. Right, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, some good things happening that clearly creates challenges and opportunities. Um, I talked a little bit about our codes and Jared mentioned some uh, code updates coming to make for a more efficient program. Those will be coming before you soon. <laughs> 
Um, community develop or community development overall is rebuilding to you know really improve process and just better represent and advocate for long range planning. Um, and that may include a citywide historic preservation plan um, and exploring opportunities along Littleton Boulevard, just to name a couple. Um, you also received an update on Design the Future um, last week, and that you know that work brings together the cities, the city, other agencies, and developers, stakeholders, with the intent to really just build a better development review process. Um, from an economic development perspective, this is a key part of our brand. Um, and then last week during that discussion, we did touch on you know, how how we're going to measure process improvement success. Um, and that will be coming as we kind of develop the implementation plan for that. Um, I want to say, though, it's not like we're metric lists. Uh, we are measuring a lot of key, key data points. Um, you know, we look at the sales tax performance. We look at commercial vacancy rates, permit building uh, or building permit valuation, new homes being built, labor participation, and so on. There's a lot of data that we look at. Jamie's actually working on updating the, the ED um, committee profile, which has a lot of that in there. And we kind of look at that as we're developing um, our annual work plans. I feel like Steve had some fantastic ideas at the last meeting about <laughs> metrics. I was really, <clears throat> felt like he took me to school, which is nice. Taking them back. <laughs> <clears throat> so, that's that's it. You know, I just I I want to quote a great philosopher, Robert Redford. You know, right? He said, <laughs> "This is true." I got I got this off the internet. Oh, so, so it's, it's, it's got to be so real. He, he went to my alma mater. He's, he's a bum. Hey. Yeah, yeah, he's a Charles Heston. He didn't graduate, I don't think. Um, he didn't have to. Same difference. Yeah. Yeah. Keep going, sorry. Right. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> Uh, but he said, problems can become opportunities when the right people come together. So that's that's how I feel about the work that we're doing. So that is all I have. Thanks. You mentioned uh, commercial um, vacancy. Do you know what we are approximately? I think nationwide we're about 19%. What are we moved to? The latest and the greatest? Oh, stump me. We are we are in a good position. It's in the retail mixed use study. Um, I'll see if I yeah, well, we we'll had see we, we had that presentation. Matter of fact, what several couple, months ago, and yeah, it was. I think we're like three percent now. That, that you think about, it. yeah, yeah, we're very tight. It's very low. Yeah, yeah. How will that change once we have more commercial retail space, like at um, Family and wherever else? I I think the quality of the developments that are coming in um, are projected to attract quality tenants. Um, so I, I don't see a huge issue with tenanting those spaces, and we are in such a tight market, um, it's almost, you know, unhealthy. So, you know, we're going to get to um, a place where, where we're in more equilibrium. And I would assume typically of those new builds that they're going to have tenants line up or else they're not going to build a structure there, so yeah. they'll I mean, I imagine it would be 100% yeah. of the <clears throat> But old um, South Glen is bleeding commercial tenants. Tough environment. Well, in Littleton Village, we're well. There's no, it's, slow. <laughs> it's no vacancy because there's no buildings there. So. Well, but there's, a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of retail on the bottom that's not filled. Yeah. Yeah. Steve's excited though. I am. That's, <laughs> so, I think there's more than just your dance. Uh, that. Five point two percent is where we're sitting. Yeah. Okay. Now. Great. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Quick question on the so when you're looking at the total building permit valuation work, you were talking about how um, historically many of the projects that were part of that valuation were relatively simple, comparatively speaking, to some of the more complex, um, higher density, higher <coughs> higher count, uh, higher height uh, projects that are going in. So I know we did an impact uh, fee analysis. Was that last year? I believe. 
Actually, the impact fee analysis is coming up this year. That's it the, is that's coming a big up. One. Okay, yeah. and I actually that so this kind of feeds into it. Do you feel like our impact fees are currently capturing the increased complexity of these projects and covering our services, or do you feel like we're we're kind of struggling to keep like do cost recovery? I will defer to the the planning. We don't have public works here either because they do. They're impacted by that. I, you know, the study will reveal if we're right sized on that or not. So it's it's a good time to be doing that work. So you're talking about just the development review fees, not impact fees. Well, I mean, so there's that, and also, I mean, impact fees are also covering, well, I guess, more operational no, services. But yes, I meant development yeah, review fees. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, with the goal of the new development kind of paying for its, paying its way for those services. It's being cost neutral new. in some regard, yeah. Yeah, the only thought I was gonna ask, are the total number of permits also increased? I mean, if you can have some high value permits, obviously they're more complex. It's, you know, you can have 10 small ones. It's easier to get through than one complex one, but. Yeah, so um, in 2022, for example, we had 20, 2,568 building permits. What the, the makeup of that is, I'm not 100% sure. And then in 23, we had 3,850. So 50% increase per number of permits, but almost a 100 and something percent increase in values. Any other questions, comments? Well, I just want to give a shout out to the community development team back there, because in the last three days, I talked to two people that are uh, in the uh, in the development world, working on projects here in Littleton, that uh, unprovoked uh, said how good it's to work in Littleton right now, and how, how how pleased they were, and how smooth things were moving. So, just want you to hear that that uh, that they they wished other communities in the metro area were um, running as smoothly as Littleton is now. So, kudos. Great. Mm -hmm. Good to hear. Yeah. Was that before or after the wine? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it was after I went over there, yeah. <laughs> before wine. What if it was before wine? <laughs> yeah, Cindy, I'll just give his comment if, I'm, if I may on a, a turn. But uh, Cindy commented on the, the changes, and we had the, the changing and evolving staff. And, you know, I, I think um, seeing the, our newer staff come on and get excited about where things are going and engage so constructively with our development community and our applicants is really a good step in the right direction. You know, it's it's taking some time, it's gonna take some time to fill the rest of the roles and um, kind of for that team, that new team to gel, but I'm inspired by the way they are really kind of working to implement those values and all the design, the future work that you saw out, uh, outlined to kind of put our, our best foot forward with our community. It's not easy work in, in Littleton where we have high standards and particular standards um, but you know they're, they do the work to put that best foot forward and make good things happen. So we're proud of that. And even more impressive that community development's at what twenty percent vacant positions right now. Moving yeah. is doing as well as you are at you know what five. Open that's positions. a percentage I did not. Calculate. <laughs> 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 well, roughly, that's a metric. Five, five is that five based on SDE or salary? What's the metric there? So. Yeah. Just, uh, right. yeah. <coughs> well, thanks yeah, for this. Thank you. Really appreciate yeah. the work. Much appreciate it. Thank you. Transition. Yeah, we'll have the next team oh, come on up. Oh, okay. So <laughs> we'll shift over. Yeah. Yeah. Or is it just going to be oh, you no, wanted for me to move Just because you're going to shuffle uh, seats. Come back for the next one. Okay, okay. exciting. Okay. We'll figure that out. Bye. We're <laughs> hiding. Here, do you have my phone number? All right, so next up we have uh, continuing with economic development uh, presentation of the comprehensive economic development strategy. Yeah, that acronym's not quick. SEDS. It's a wonderful marketing. It's going to be our marketing tag forever. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, so uh, this is, we're, we're getting there on this, this plan. I think we, we have some uh, plan conclusions and some plan, plan recommendations to, to share tonight. Just in, in terms of importance and what this does for us, you know, economic development 
departments and functions within cities can do a whole lot of things. And um, in theory, they can cover that gamut of business attraction, retention, expansion, all of those things. We have a team of three, in, three in individuals who, who have support from lots of other departments, but we have to be pretty focused in terms of how we use our time and our, our resources. And this process and this plan is an opportunity for all of us, for council and staff to make sure we're on the same page and have the right posture as we look to the future um, for how we're gonna best use our time and our focus for business attraction, retention, expansion, all of that, that work. So this, this, uh, this, this process from, I'll say from my standpoint, I believe from the teams is to, um, you know, inform us and then en enable you to make, to make decisions based on recommendations coming from the business community, from staff about our focus, the kind of economy, the kind of economic development we think we'll see in the future based on where we sit in the region and what our context is. And I know the team's done a lot of work on that um, so that we can be focused and we can be as effective as possible in driving toward the uh, results that you want. So that's what this, this uh, project, our economic development strategy, I won't call it says, uh, is for. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cindy to, you know, to introduce our, our team and just and give an overview of, of where, where we are and the recommendations for coming forward. I know Cindy said earlier that this might be it. We're really wanting your input tonight. We're scheduled to come back at a future council meeting for adoption of this economic development strategy. So we really are seeking your input and making sure we're on the right track tonight. Cindy. Yes. Uh, we did try to come up with something more creative than SEDS, but we just came up dry. We'll keep working through that. Root and Renew is doing better with these. <laughs> yeah, that was, the yeah. Than, uh, I know. <laughs> um, so a SEDS is, yes, it's to help us focus. It's a strategy. It's also a, a key piece in the event that um, we want to go and request uh, federal EA funds. It's a requirement to be updated every five years. We haven't updated ours in a bit, so this gets us back on track um, with that. Um, the final report does include a different menu of funding options, um, federal, state, and even local. Um, David from Future IQ is going to kind of talk through some of the key outcomes of the process um, and then talk about what we heard from the community and, and the stakeholder meetings. Um, and then the fun part, talk, talk through a little bit of some of the actionable items that are gonna come out of this. So uh, um, I'll, I'll reiterate that this process applied both qualitative and quantitative data, um, which included one-on-one -on -one sessions with stakeholders, we did surveys, we had a think tank, um, we also incorporated the, um, the Polco business survey data and then data from the retail and mixed use study that you recently heard. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to David and once he's done with his presentation, we have a little surprise for everybody. So we worked on a brand video that you all are the first to get to see tonight. Um, we used a Colorado-based production company to help support our work, and we'll use that video in our um, ongoing marketing of the city, and our tagline is an authentic place to do business. So, David? Okay, thank you, Cindy. Hello, everybody. Mayor, Council, uh, good to be back. So, I know I met a number of you I think it was August the 8th we were here, which was midway in the process, right? So it's great to be back to give you an update of where we got to um, as we go forward. Um, and I'm obviously representing a team of people who worked on this from our side. Um, I do want to call out too that this has been a very collaborative process with Cindy and her team. So what we've got in the plan has been really co-developed and vetted very closely with, with her team and obviously with um, a large group of stakeholders in the business community and the broader community. Um, so, things I just want to hit on, I'm going to be quite high level because you've got the full report and the materials, so I just really want to, I want to give you my narrative, right? I want to give you my take of what I heard and, and why I think that's important. Um, we're going to talk about the outcomes, uh, what we heard, 
um, and what we're going to do going forward. Um, we, um, yeah, you know, Jamie's going to pull this up. We, so if you remember, we talked about the project portal um, when I last presented. This has been the sort of go-to place for this project, so where people can go and take surveys and see the results and so on. Um, we just today put up what we call a story map. Uh, this is a, just a real summary of the uh, economic development strategy process and approach and outcomes. Most people are not going to read a 40-page report, right? So this is a simple scan through that people in the community can look at. You know, it just talks about the timeline, um, talks about the community engagement. You can hit on that button and kind of people can walk through, uh, see some of the different engagement opportunities and so on. Um, the strategic pillars I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but then if you, if you click on that one, Jamie, on the side. Um, so it's just a simple, um, but a real summary way that people can kind of get what the whole process is and what the outcome is in a sort of a three second scan through really, right? Um, so we just put that up today. Um, but back to the presentation. Quick um, question on this, yeah. the, the story map there. Yeah. So was that, that was your team that did that? Yeah. Okay. Because I know, um, getting off topic here a little bit, but Project Downtown, um, had a story map as well. I wonder if there was any continuity between having having the, the site look the exact same way if people are going to different ones that they kind of operate in the same <coughs> way. It's hard if you have different consultants um, designing those. Yeah, no, the, uh, this is independent of that. Um, summarizing, you know, this work, um, I would have to go back and look at the project downtown one to see if, you know, there's, there's similar functionality and kind of that. Yeah, I remember I haven't obviously haven't seen that one, but I didn't know what that project downtown was. It, I really liked it, it was good. And we can cross link those as well, right? So on that portal we can do a hyperlink to that as well. We can all have a look at that. Um, so we're to, really towards the end of this process. Um, when I was last here was as I said early August, so we had just uh, finished the think tank and we were just starting the focus groups when I was here. So we're kind of midpoint in the process. Um, since then, we've done uh, a lot of work with groups of stakeholders looking at ideas around different sort of focus areas, um, been developing you know, draft recommendations, toolkits. Uh, I don't think you mentioned the student survey, but we ran a student survey that was uh, really ran through November, December. So we had about uh, just shy of 300 uh, students, um, 16, 17, 18 year olds, and we were asking them about their view about the future in terms of trends. Um, what they thought about living in little term, what they thought about working. It was a really just a nice piece to, to add to that because, to, you know, we're going to talk about future workforce, right? And, you know, we were able to tap into them um, and the story maps and so on, right? So there's a fair bit that we've added since we were last here. Um, one of the things I do want to just hit on is that you, you did kind of, last time I was here, you did sort of probe a little about um, the methodology and the process and the level of engagement. And, and I've got to say, you made us think about that, right? And we went back and we really kind of looked at that. And I think we built a lot of extra uh, depth into that engagement process. We went back and conferred with some of the people we'd talked to in our first interviews. And we added some virtual focus group sessions and the student survey. Um, so we heard you. And I think we did a pretty good job actually expanding that out. Um, in terms of engagement, I mean, t we added newsletters and so on. So we have like tens of thousands of exposures to people in the community about this planning process, building awareness about the importance of economic development and having a strategy for the city. Um, so getting to the sort of more the heart of this, um, in terms of the, the framework for this, and I want to just kind of walk through this and talk about why these elements are here and what we think the objectives are and what we want to accomplish. So at the core of this, what we heard from the engagement about what people wanted for the future, so the forward-looking, future-looking piece, um, there was really a desire for people to see Littleton, and the way they articulate it was a, a creative, cutting-edge small town. So there's an interesting duality in that. So one is preserving the character, and you're very familiar with that. You, know, you would hear that as part of the DNA of this community, that people love this small town feel and the the density of amenities and all those things that come with it. Um, but I think the, the, the piece that got pushed forward a little bit was this notion of this cutting edge. Um, and, and people, I think my paraphrasing it is that people felt pretty good about the small town. They saw ways to protect that, some concerns about where they may get challenged. Um, but there was a concern that 
we could do more on the cutting edge. So think more about technology and think about being future ready with workforce and so on. Um, so there's a duality in that, but it's a pretty potent sort of a aspiration that people had. The big bubbles around that, we call those strategic pillars. Um, these are the big building blocks that we think we need to focus on in the work that gets done in the city um, in being able to make that kind of future possible. Um, and I'm going to spend a bit of time on these, but um, just at summary level, we're talking about business vitality and adaptability. So particularly focusing on small business, that's really a key part of the lifeblood of your economy. Um, but there's a lot of challenges coming to small business or to anybody, right? So how do they adapt and evolve? Um, workforce and talent attraction, I think that's a pretty exciting area for, for your community. You have some competitive advantages there, and I want to talk a bit about what the student survey said and how that ties in. Um, there's this notion of uh, fostering a livable um, economy. Um, and one of the concerns that people have, what that's really targeting is thinking creatively about how do you guide your community um, so that you're able to still create it as a livable place, you know, to have a diverse community where there can be young people and old people living here. I think the concern people have is you could get priced out of your own market, you know, because you're an attractive place, people want to come here, you don't have much expansion capacity. Um, so there's this real desire to think creatively about retaining that livability um, and that ability for people to be able to live here. Historic character and cultural fabric, I think that's a pretty exciting area, we'll talk about that. Um, and then this sort of bigger picture of supporting industry and investment in city infrastructure. Um, any good economic development strategy is going to hit on infrastructure. Um, and I think there's some good ideas in this uh, about that. So to make sure that you don't fall behind. You know, one of the challenges is how do you maintain infrastructure to serve <coughs> these future types of industries, but also um, you know, adapt to technology and stuff as we go forward. Um, and then the regional economic positioning, um, that's really making sure you've got a seat at the table. You know, there are a lot of big things happening around you, um, and this part of the plan is about making sure that your voice is represented and that the things you want are on the table when you think of the larger Denver um, sort of MSA and so on. Would, would you mind like, <coughs> highlighting for what me when you go through this, yeah. um, what parts of this you think are cutting edge? Yeah. That's the part that I was most interested in, kind of understanding how you were thinking about yeah. that. Yeah, okay. And yeah, just, I, just keep going. But. Yeah, and I, I would say that there's a lot of this is pretty what you would call, you know, bread and butter, box right. standard, yeah. what you've got to have in a good economic development strategy, right? There are parts here that I think you can bring it to life, and that's what I think the cutting edge pieces are. Yeah. So, great. That, that was my interpretation, yeah. too, that it was pretty... Which is great. It should be. You got to get the bread and butter first. But yeah. I just want to understand that. And the and the little surprise at the end will be part of the cutting edge as well, right? Thank you. Um, so I just want to walk through. I'm going to give you my narrative on this. So feel free to sort of you know sort of jump in and probe this as we go. Um, six pillars. First one: business vitality and adaptability. Um, so about strategizing, and bringing new businesses to to the community, fostering this entrepreneurship, and supporting your your um, existing business network. So you do have a pretty good small business concentration, um, reasonable amount of support framework there, uh, but we think we could kind of dial that up a little bit. Um, there's the opportunity here in terms of sort of these broad actions of um, sort of more celebrating and fostering and nurturing um, small businesses. Um, I think that's going to be a really interesting area going forward. There's been some pieces you probed on, like the recast, this idea of you know, maybe small manufacturing and so on, um, potential uh, areas there. This whole ecosystem approach I think is really important in today's world. If you're if you're a small business, you got a lot of demands to deal with, right? And what we see successful communities are doing or business concentrations is where you have an ecosystem approach where you build a lot of this peer support um, and they're able to work together and, and provide direction. Um, the fourth one there is about um, this pursuit narrative was a term that actually came out by one of the focus groups. Um, so this idea of sort of getting clear about what are the type of businesses you want here and being more proactive about going to get them. So that's not been part of the modus operandi of the city previously, um, but there's some guidance certainly from the focus group saying, you know, 
we don't, we, we need to step up and figure out what do we want and then go and pursue some of that um, in a bit of more of an aggressive manner. Do they um, have some suggestions or ideas along those lines? Yeah. Um, some, right? So I think that's some a topic area that's going to get developed out more as we think about that. Um, certainly uh, things like tourism and arts and culture are the kind of the obvious sort of low-hanging fruits. I think the other more interesting areas, but I, you know, this is going to be something that's going to require a little bit more work, but, but thinking about some of that stuff like um, sort of uh, sort of job-dense businesses is what you need, right? So, you know, you're not big box stores, right? But, but stuff where you've got a lot of people who are being paid well, employed in fairly small spaces, right? So, so that notion of sort of density of workforce. Um, so some of those things might be interesting small-scale manufacturing, for example, could be some of the areas. Now, that's not ground-truthed or tested fully, right? But that's where some of the ideas were going. So some of the obvious things, arts, culture, those type of things, but also some of these potential uh, areas of smaller and medium business um, that are perhaps applying technology, but also high-paid jobs that are pretty dense in terms of employment base. Um, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this fits there, but one thing that was in the full report yeah. of 4.8.2, yeah. championing home-based business regulation reform. Yeah, that's the next piece, yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because I thought I'm very supportive of that. I've seen other communities do it, and I think when we're thinking about adapting our workforce and really supporting mm -hmm. local business and small business, like removing some of the restrictions that prevent people from having in-home businesses yeah. and having our code kind of match for that um, use, I'm, I would love to see some recommendations of what we could do as a council to do that. Yeah, and there was a, there's a couple of ideas in here. That that's what that last th piece there about in initiatives that ensure ongoing vitality and adaptability. So that some of that is about making sure that you don't have barriers, like so sort of the permitting processes. You know, I think a quarter of the people in the business survey said that the permitting process is frustrating to them, right? And so what we're suggesting an audit of that and an audit of some of the incentives that uh, the city provides. You know, just thinking very strategically about making sure you're not unintentionally having barriers put up to, to, to particularly to if you're going to push on an entrepreneurial small business landscape. I think we have to consider the neighborhoods. Certain types of small business have low activity, not much impact. Yeah. Other types of businesses could have a big impact. So yeah. I don't know how do you balance the needs of the neighbors with um, businesses. Yeah, and I, and I think we'll, one of these other pillars we get to that, I think as you go into the comprehensive planning process and you start to think about uh, land use um, and we talk about some of these sort of thinking about how some of these economic areas evolve, like strip malls and things like that, I, I think there's going to have to be some thought put into to making sure that you kind of help figure some of those things out. Littleton Boulevard's a classic. I'll talk about that in terms of an area that could see a lot of development, but it's butted right up against where people live, right? And that can have unintended consequences. So we'll just talk that through the buffers or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so the next one, um, workforce and talent attraction. Um, you've got to have this in your economic development strategy. I mean, we're in a talent war. Everybody's like, if you're 3% unemployment, everybody is, right? So you have a certain advantage, though, because you have you know, college campus here, county uh, community college, uh, EPIC and other things. So you have this really interesting concentration of um, um, sort of talent generation. Um, what was really interesting to me in the student survey, and this data we haven't put on the portal yet, is that, um, and what surprised me in the data, was that we asked students about how much did they like living or studying in Littleton, right? Not at all to a lot, right? Um, over 80% of people in some way or another liked it, right? Which is a higher number than you would normally see. So it skews very strongly towards people um, students, 16, 17, 18 year olds, enjoying being here and really appreciating it, right? So that's a real plus, right? Um, when we asked the question about do you see a future for yourself here in a career or living here, that dilutes a little bit. Um, but in the open-ended responses, um, I think there's a real opportunity to talk, connect into those young people <clears throat> certainly not a, some big barrier of people going, I hate it, it's boring, don't have anything to do with it. I mean, they were very thoughtful responses. And I think when we think about talent attraction, 
Um, we've talked things there about hiring local talent, thinking about local workforce pipelines. Um, I think you've got a really interesting opportunity. Um, you've got a great student body and educational facilities, and you seem to have students who that there's a there's an appetite or a willingness to to, to make this their home, uh, or at least think about that. Um, but the other stuff there, the other recommendations are, are going to be pretty sort of obvious um, things as we get into it. Um, um, fostering a livable community. Um, this is a really important piece that came up over and over. You know, it, was, it surprised me probably a little that in an economic development strategy conversation, how much about livability and about affordability came up for people. So that's part of that polarity and that central vision, which is that, you know, this notion of a cutting edge place, but we're still a small town, right? People are concerned about losing that. So um, what we worked on in the some of the focus groups was really thinking about um, ideas and approaches about how do you kind of have, and you actually have a fairly um, sort of large senior population, how do we think about transition so they can live here? Um, how can young people, you know, who may be wanting to start a business come here and live here? How can they afford it? How do you put in place policies as a council that helps um, housing affordability and options? Um, multimodal um, approaches, so really leaning into what sort of urban living people are going to look for in the future. So this whole pillar area was really about, from an economic development lens, how do you design your community to make it a great place that people can stay living in here and keep working here? Um, there was a strong piece here about community image, identity and livability and being able to promote that, um, which we'll talk more about um, later on. Um, so there's, and there's some ideas in there. Um, the, the key part of this, I think the implementable part, is incorporating economic development in a stronger way in your upcoming comprehensive plan. So really having that as an overlay and thinking about those issues about uh, zoning and having that economic development overlay um, in that plan. Um, this next pillar, um, historic character and the cultural fabric, I, I think this is one of the pieces that could be a, a cutting edge. Certainly some of the things I just talked about, people were wanting to push on that. Um, this one I think is really interesting and the, the discussion and the recommendations here primarily focus around Littleton Boulevard. That's the, that's the big piece here, right? So a few things why that's a real focus, right? It's obviously an, a key east-west connector, um, but it's an area that could be the next significant development. So you already have a very vibrant downtown and you have the Downtown Development Association and all those pieces, right? Um, in almost all the discussions we had, Littleton Boulevard came up as that's our... That's something we could do something really interesting with, is what people talked about. Um, so we've talked about this um, activating the streetscape, an overlay district that sort of gives some guidance for what could happen there. Um, really trying to understand what the, the economic impact of arts and culture is in this community. So that's not being quantified. Um, I think at the broader Denver area, the most recent studies say it's a $2.6 billion economic driver. You've got some share of that. We don't really know how big that is, but trying to understand that would be really important. Um, I think this could be a really interesting area. There's lots of kind of energy around it, some ideas, um, and it could be a real connector between you know the extension of that downtown experience um, and part of that sort of drawing people here um, and bolstering that economy. I think, and particularly if you take the architectural overlay as well, um, I think that could be a very interesting cutting edge piece. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David, this might be a place to talk about the interplay with historic preservation. I think that's some of what you're talking about. Yep. You might go a little further into the what you know, uh, what's old can be new again, and you reused and you know have, be part of that uh, vitality. If, if you have any thoughts on that, yeah. So um, yeah, we do. So and this was something we talked about from our side a lot in the process. Um, and looked at case studies of um, where historic preservation has been part of an economic driver in sort of Main Street context and so on. Um, I think the challenge here is it, that you could lose what you've got potentially in Littleton Boulevard. You know, you have you know that sort of push on that sort of mid-mod mile and so on. 
you've got sort of legacy architectural buildings. Um, they're still there largely because the area hasn't been redeveloped, right? And so you could lose that, right? And so, and you don't, and you only have a certain number of those key architectural sort of properties. Um, that's why we're putting a real spotlight on this because in your comprehensive planning process, and even if you wanted to do something as an as an overlay, I think grabbing hold of that while it's there and thinking thoughtfully about how that develops. I think the community sees Littleton Boulevard and the potential, you know, the the Cherry Cricket. You know, everyone talks about that in terms of how that's brought renewed life from the brewery. Um, there's, but there's got to be some thinking done to say, okay, how do we have pockets of activity here that don't spill over and destroy the neighbourhood experience of people who live completely adjacent to that or you know, right adjacent to that? Um, so I do think, we think there's big potential there, right? I think it's got to be proved up. Um, but, you know, if you look at the arts and culture and try to understand the scale of this, what it, could, what it is and what it could be, um, that's what that last point there is. Thanks. I mean, in essence, that's what we did with downtown. I mean, I was exactly. to kind of recreate that in a different yeah. way um, across Boulevard, yeah. Yeah, and it could be, a, it could be just a really <coughs> natural and logical extension so that you don't just get... You know, this development occurs downtown and then it gets stagnated because you can't continue to grow or evolve it, right? But it could, it could move along and could build up. Have you seen things in other cities? Like we, I mean, Cherry Cricket is great. Yeah. But we also get citizens that are very frustrated that they're losing their parking spaces in front of their houses. So how have other cities have found the development and the impact on the neighborhood? Yeah. Parking, but there's other things, noise or whatever, or lighting. Exactly. There's an entire world there, of course, in urban yeah. design, thinking about streetscapes, you know, uh, you've got an important corridor, do you narrow that down, slow traffic, there's, there's just a whole bunch of stuff there, right? Um, I, think the, I think the issue of the impact on the neighbouring uh, residents, I think that's, that's the key thing to figure out, right? If you, if you walk that um, strip, there's actually a fair bit of real estate there, right, that's not you know, there are sort of historic buildings that kind of tend to be quite up close to the curb, but there's some pretty big parking areas. And so I think thinking that through now before developers just keep coming and chopping it up for you, um, I think that's going to be really important. I think this is one area as council and as city staff, you need to kind of, my recommendation is you've got to get your arms around this and figure out how does that develop? Because there are, while there's land there, you've got options on parking, right? You can figure out where to put parking and where to put the walking and the connections and so on. If you don't do that and you start losing that, it just puts too much pressure on those neighbourhoods on each side. So I, mean, I think considering the impacts in the neighbourhood is, is important, you know, whether it's parking or other, you know, like other stuff. You know, also it's relative to specific with Cherry Cricket. I think there's kind of a short-term memory that. It had been vacant for however many years, and there was no activity there. But prior to that, there were restaurants there, and there were people parking there too. So it's yeah. You know, I, I like the word that you used, which was buffer, because I I think we need to that. I mean, that word really resonated a lot yep. with me. Is that we, we we have this idea about in kind of dense both commercial and and residential development, yep. and we have to figure out how to buffer that from our our you know my very suburban big lot neighborhood and, and so I, and for me buffer is the word that we need to think about as we as we move forward yeah and, and to the question about you know what are the solutions i mean a lot of urban design these days in areas like that it's you create very dedicated dense parking areas and get people out of their cars and get them walking along the boulevard right and going going to those sort of little destination areas and so on <clears throat> but you concentrate that parking impact and you control it, manage it in a way so that it's not spilling over into into other areas. I, I'm interested in this arts component. I think, um, you know, our arts institutions were all really products of the boomers yep. and Gen X, and and I'm ex I'm excited about the investments that the city's making in in the arts, but I'm also worried that we kind of have a next generation of arts, um, in, in, you know, institutions that, you know, that. Were, reflect the changing community. And I'm worried we're, we've got to think about how do we catch up with what arts mean to people who don't have as much gray hair as I do. Um, and so 
I, I think it's, I mean, I think we're making great investments. It's super exciting. I just, that's a place where I'd like us to think about cutting edge. What does that mean? Yeah, and if you, you know, these, these pillars actually all interconnect, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, yeah. And if you look at the student survey, you know, not, not surprisingly, they talk a lot about what would they like to see or make the place more appealing, would be more mm -hmm. events and, you know, sort of the more modern Something cultural about activities. This guy, what this guy was talking about? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, um, did you, by the way, did you share that student survey with the school district? Um, I don't think we just do. We're still finishing up. Oh, do you mean did they share it or did was it we, shared? Where? Yeah. yeah. So uh, LPS sent the survey out. Okay. We're in the middle of doing a, a data visual visualization, and we'll share that back Great. with them. Great. So, you need me to help facilitate that. Let me know. Being on the fine arts and the arts and culture, I think there's some exciting arts. Oh, stuff. great! Thank you. Uh, wonderful. And yeah, with arts, I mean. With no, I think there's. I just yeah, I think there are some great things. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Um, back to Littleton Boulevard before we leave that. I, I think the idea you came up with is dedicated parking, and I don't know what other solutions there are. But what's the timeline so that we don't have more and more cherry cricket issues coming up? And then we go, oh darn, we should have thought about that. I mean, is there a plan to, and are we waiting for this historic preservation person? I mean, is this something part of the preservation plan? What's the thinking? Your next agenda item <laughs> the opportunity right. to have some thought I, there. It, oh, it's top of mind. I had a because citizen meeting last night, and they were just pounding me on why can't yeah. we get permit parking in I'll, Terry Creek? I'll just Creek. say historic, you know, the, the prospect of a historic preservation plan or an overlay district for Littleton Boulevard would be one of the planning initiatives that you know would be competing for priority with some of the other ULUC uh, type code amendments that you know we're we're seeking your your direction on tonight. So you'll be seeing that in the next item that we'll, we'll have some conversation about that. And, and certainly in terms of this, we're, we're suggesting some of those building blocks uh, are this year and next year, right? So there is a sense of urgency on that. And, and it ties to the comprehensive plan. Uh, securing knockout of lots of wood. The historic uh, uh, preservation planner who, you know, is experienced, has done this, will be a major step forward to, I think, you know, moving that program forward in a way that we haven't for a, at least a number of months. And... Hopefully that all works out, but I hope there's a contingency plan in case it doesn't, so we're not sitting here for another six months to a year waiting for somebody to come help us. Yeah, yeah that, if I can add to, there's another piece to the preservation, which is the, the architectural features in your neighborhoods. And so that's, I'm not calling that out, but I do, I don't, I do want to mention that too, because I think that's, that person's going to have a, have a job thinking about how do you manage that, you know, as, do you get the knock, you know, the tear down, rebuild, or do you sort of put in place things to preserve facades and working way through that? But but we want to call out from an economic development strategy. We want to particularly call out this little boulevard. Um, I'll just quickly run through the next two just to, to finish this out. Um, this is a big one here around the the whole infrastructure. It's not it's not the super sexy one, right? Um, but there's, there's obviously work to be done to maintain your infrastructure, and that's going to require thinking about investment. And I'm sure Cindy's going to be talking um, going forward about, you know, how do you, how do you fund that? But there's some other key partnerships here, like South Park and so on. Um, there's a lot of property there or some property there that, that, you know, traditional office space, that's, you know, the market's changing, obviously, right? So how do they adapt? How to strip malls? How do they change? So I think there's going to be, be thinking about how do we think about sort of modernising and, and allowing or removing barriers to the evolution of some of those different types of property and having the community have a conversation about, well, an industrial park mm. may look different in the future than it does today, right? It may not just be a, you know, people coming to work in an office. It might be different sort of um, businesses in there. Um, and then there's the regional uh, positioning, which I did talk about. Um, there's obviously some really big um, issues going on in the whole region. Um, I think you're going to, you know, you need to have a seat at the table, right? So what we're encouraging in this plan is that you, you know, ensure that Cindy and city manager and others are there, you know, really talking about Littleton um, and, and really helping focus some of the attention here, but also making sure regional decisions go your way as opposed to, 
you know, you're on the receiving end of decisions that get made at a broader scale. Um, so I just want to leave it there. I know we're just a fraction over time, but that's where we've got to. There's a lot more detail, obviously, in the report, but I wanted to sort of give you the thinking and where it came from. Um, I think taking together those six pillars is a, you know, a good hearty meal of, you know, good solid economic development strategy. Um, and I think there are pieces in there that, that, you know, you can pull out and start to bring a bit of a cutting edge approach to. Um, and I, certainly I think it reflects some of the appetite in the community um, to see some of these, you know, some of the new ideas come forward. So, if it's okay before we start questions, can we roll the premier surprise? Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Sure. Well, I got ten questions. <laughs> Gotta wait. For <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> And so, the sun rises on yet another beautiful day here in Littleton, Colorado. Flowers reach to the sky, lawnmowers buzz, as small businesses crack open their doors, greeting the day's eager customers. Bikes surge along the bike paths and trails. Lush parks are filled with families enjoying the warm sun. Playgrounds ring out with the sounds of laughter. Everywhere you look, there's life, art, vibrancy, adventure, and hope. This, this is no ordinary city. This is Littleton, Colorado, offering the perfect blend of endless opportunities and hometown charm. A place you instantly recognize as home. Littleton stands at the crossroads of a strong legacy with a rich history that shapes our future where exploration and expansion go hand in hand. It's the perfect place to start a business, to grow a business, or to find the highly trained workforce your corporation needs to succeed. Small, independent businesses flourish, growing in tandem with industry leaders in aerospace, healthcare, and finance. Here lies the foundation of an entire lifetime of stories good schools, friendly communities, and plenty of opportunities to let loose and have some fun. Generations of families growing, exploring, experiencing life at its fullest. And so, the day melts into dusk, where a lifetime of extraordinary memories are created on a backdrop of tremendous possibility. Littleton, Colorado, an authentic approach to business. Speak you didn't to pay your stack fees, so. Extended Smitty, Smitty, could, could you speak to the audience and how would this be used and that, those sorts of things? Yeah, so um, we'll use this in all of our business attraction um, packaging. It'll be on our website, Channel 8. Um, when we go and speak at events, we'll have this as kind of an opener or if we're um, exhibiting, it'll be, play, it'll be rolling on a screen. Um, Kelly's team is, I mean, I feel like this video is um, broad enough that it's economic development, it's community-based, it promotes the arts, it promotes a lot of, a lot of the elements that we heard about in, in the strategic planning process. Um, so yeah, you all can have it shared on websites, email communication, so, and I'm open to ideas on other ways that you want to use it. Can I speak yeah. that a little bit? So we also have the raw footage of this, so we'll be able to cut That's little... Videos, right? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> cutting room floors. Well, she didn't say cutting room floors. <laughs> 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 it's a video. transition. in my journal. Um, <laughs> we'll be able to cut little strips for different marketing pieces and kind of reuse. Um, there's a lot more footage besides just that, so we'll be able to use it for, yeah. for a long time. Yeah, it'll be repackaged for, we're going to give footage to the DDA and the businesses that participated for, for cross-promotion. Yeah. I, I just think it's, for, as an outsider, right, I think it's pitch perfect to what we heard. 
people talk about, how they talk about the community, because it's even got that little quirky kind of angle to it, right? And so I think that really, to me, it really reflects what we heard people talking about. They want it in the economic development strategy, but also that sweet spot in the middle of a little bit of the cutting edge, but we're the small town, so we've got this kind of polarity that we're, we're kind of managing, and I think it just does a great job on that. I think it did a, it's really great, and it, it, it highlights a lot of our real assets. I have a little anxiety that the, it's not as diverse as I think we need it for our future recruitment. Not a lot of people in there look like me, which is boring. Um, so I just have anxiety about that. Well, and that, that word <laughs> and that issue is what the students talked about. If the, you know, yeah. What they want to see the community, how they want to see it evolve, would be more inclusivity and diversity. And I, I would give an amen. So my last role was working in the school district and I met with students uh, from the last, one of the last things I did on the school district was meet with students from uh, one of the high schools and, and the lack of diversity was really important to them. Luke, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit more about the cutting edge? I'm not seeing the snippets of conversation or really what it means other than a technology company. Can you kind of speak to that? Because when I talk to citizens, they talk about preserving character, but they don't use words cutting edge, but they may not use those exact words. But what what is it that's <coughs> cutting edge? Yeah. Could I, could I have a go at that? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think this is really nuanced, right? So it's people don't want to live in a museum. So people want to live in a place that's got charm and it's got that kind of familiarity that people love, the semi-rural kind of feel, right? Um, but I think there's a lot of appetite for what you might call kind of cutting edge intrusion, right? So multimodal and how you tackle that, um, housing options, how you, how you increase density in a very gentle way. You know, there's some very creative ways you could do that. And I think it's cutting edge in the application of principles around modern urban design and designing your community to reflect how people want to live today. Um, it also ties into things like um, thinking about some of these nodes around your community, like Littleton Boulevard, how that could develop. You know, sort of. So it's an overlay of, a, of an approach. And there's implicit in that is there a willingness to take a little bit of a risk is what we, what we heard a lot of. I mean, people do know that this is a prosperous community. You know, you're in good shape. Um, there's a little bit of a chance to experiment with some things, some of these big challenges, you know, like how do you get people out of their cars and, you know, reduce that car traffic and how do you solve housing affordability issues. There was, an, there was a willingness that we heard a lot of to try different things to see what you could apply. Um, so I think that's the, that's the framework of cutting edge as opposed to it necessarily being just a technology development or something like that. One Thank thing you. that I really liked was the the matrix, the grid, um, and in the we talked about a little bit last August mm -hmm. of the evolving in place versus the little town lost in time, preserving Littleton, and then really having that creative cutting edge, and that helped me um, think about I think what what you're struggling with a little that approach. So that's in the full report, and it's on page thirty two yeah. in our materials, Pam. In 3.3, it's highlighted um, as well, like how we're moving into that trajectory. And, and the example of that, just to take that, because I'm, I'm glad you called that out, because if you take the historic... I read the report. Well done, right? <laughs> if you take the historic preservation piece, right? So you can go different ways on that. You can just kind of like wrap it up in, in bubble wrap and just sort of preserve it, right? Or you can take it and turn it into part of an ambience and a part of a of an experience, right? And so that's the difference. So I think what people here are saying, we want the preservation, but we want it at the level of that it enhances our experiences rather than we just, you know, like a museum. As city manager, I will say that's gonna also prompt some questions about some financial risks and incentives. And the vision that we're kind of creating and, and, and talking about tonight, you know, when we can crystallize what that, um, cutting edge might look like in terms of policies, the city council may have opportunities, I'll, I'll call it, to incentivize uh, some of those in, in terms of how to attract. You know, one, one area that I, th I think is exciting for us when we talk about the arts, you know, we love the arts, we talk about the arts, there are great ideas in the works for having more art, 
but how do we get artists here and how do we get people valuing studio space and converting, you know, thinking of how we use our space if that's truly what we want? Well, that's going to take some financial, probably, investment in ways that have not, that are, are less traditional and are more cutting edge because it means taking some risk and making some financial investments in what we say we want. So I'm looking forward to that part of the conversation as we take these recommendations and these plans into more policy. Yeah. Uh, and I think that ties to that sort of the narrative about being really clear about what kind of businesses you want and are you willing to go out and invest in recruiting those, so that the business attraction piece. We talked about incentives yeah. two weeks, last week or two weeks ago. Maybe we're gonna, you know, you have to think, think pretty creatively about that to get what we want. And that is a recommendation and yep. here is to look at, you know, how we package um, those incentives in a more targeted fashion. So that does come directly out of Yes. Yeah. And, and the piece I would just to conclude that is that what we heard or what I drew from the discussions and we probed this a fair bit, I always want to probe it when, when I'm detecting an appetite for change because you know, you never want the council to then go, oh, okay, people are saying be bold, and the moment you're bold, then you'll get, you know, <laughs> taken apart, right? Yeah. Um, so we did test that, and I do think there is there is an appetite for for taking some risk, right? No, not crazy risk, obviously, but calculated risks that are aligned to your vision and to your community values, I think, would, would gather support. On the risk of being labelled a tree killer, Get, is, it, is it standard procedure to have printed copies of some of these reports, or is not? Not standard. Not standard anymore. We they, they're you know we're trying to push more online, and we can make copies if anyone requests them, either council or the public. Um, but we are uh, trying to move toward electronic materials. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Which point. dovetails really nicely into my next discussion. Where, um, honestly, first off, thank you for this, and I, and I think it does, you know, align with, you know, a lot of the discussions we've been having, a lot of things we hear from various departments in our community. I think, you know, there's a lot in both the report and obviously your presentation that I don't know if it puts. Littleton at the forefront almost even enough and like in terms of our workforce and the kinds of economic sectors that we want to be attracting to our area and Honestly, I think a missed opportunity that aligns really well with current opportunities and funding for workforce development for business attraction is in the environmental and climate space and you know just for example last week um, Dr. Cog's uh, uh, leadership in terms of their climate pollution reduction grant program is looking at putting another $20 million towards workforce development and uh, linemen, electrification sector, HVAC technicians. So you've got you know one end of the spectrum, it's the blue collar working jobs, and then you've got the other end of the spectrum of consulting. And quite honestly, that, that visualization, that economic driver has really been captured by places like Boulder and Golden, and it doesn't need to be. Um, there's, there's ample room and space for other uh, 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 south suburban metro community to really like take another piece of that pie and i think it's well worth it because we're talking about pro environmental work with our housing with our transportation we're already starting to put those pieces together and i think if our economic development strategy in terms of even workforce in terms of business attraction leaned hard into it i bet you could break off of a piece of the pie in that golden and boulder market mm -hmm that quite frankly, most people are priced out of at this point, like miles beyond where we are. And um, we could be that next, you know, group. We are doing great things in our public works department. You know, like we have our new environmental stewardship committee that's gonna be proactively making recommendations about residential education programs, workforce training, building electrification. It's, I mean, there's a lot of components there that you, if you, if we leaned into it hard, could be a linchpin for a lot of these pillars. Is that workforce that you're describing a workforce that would be trained by the Epic Center and ACC? 
It very well could be, and I've already started talking to them about using those places as central training centers for some of those contractors. Well, and I think the Epic Center definitely has a focus on some of this environmental and natural resources. Component. Exactly. Um, but it's also... Um, I think Steve's story is like, you know, Boulder has this green vibe, and so businesses that have that tilt, it doesn't matter where they're trained. I mean, it just it could be a clothing manufacturer. It could be, you know, something that they want to start up there go there because of that energy that that community has and I think you're trying to say hey Littleton could also have that if we kind of focused on a little bit more of that attraction for that if you think about it like Boulder and 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 Golden quite honestly have held that mantle for so long and quite frankly it's gotten stale like most people realize they're like well we're we're pro-environmental but like we don't have any affordable housing we don't have multimodal transportation we're you know businesses are having a tough time keeping up rent in those places you just need a national lab and, and honestly, no one, I mean, like when we talk about tech and aerospace, which has kind of been like our go-to script for business attraction, it's good because like there's obviously we're still growing those sectors in solid, stable jobs, but it doesn't necessarily differentiate us between Highlands Ranch or Centennial or really any of the other, you know, metro area. Yeah, it, it, it's in there, mm -hmm. but, but I think we could call it out a couple, yeah. put us some spotlights on I'm with you right but it's not you know not my community right but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I try and do a pretty good job of re yeah push a little bit reflect what people are saying and we did probe that but mm -hmm. but I do think that there's some of the things we can put in there as perhaps sort of even kind of bold ideas that you know go, just open the door for some of those bigger conversations because not everybody's quite ready to be honest right oh yeah no it, absolutely not and it, it's a law it's a large and comprehensive and quite honestly a politically charged conversation yeah. oftentimes I, i'm only putting and honestly i'm not saying go back and change sets and throw climate and environment more in it more saying like when it comes to the actual implementation putting that character and flavor into the implementation of it, I think would reap more benefits than not. And I, I, I hear an opportunity here to, to, to go, maybe we go back and just highlight a couple of what we see the cutting edge pieces are, right? Mm -hmm. In different sections, like not saying that's the recommendation, but here's, here's what that could look like if you wanted to be a bit bolder, right? Mm -hmm. We could do that in each one of those pillars, I think would. Because cutting edge for a lot of folks, you know, like, to your point, it was like, I don't know what cutting edge is. Is it a no, new social media app? And we can reframe what cutting edge means to be like, you know, better battery technologies or green stormwater infrastructure that is truly cutting edge infrastructure, too. I mean, you can define cutting, I mean, cutting edge to be a coffee shop at a oh, gas station. I mean, I mean it's not, reusing a check, I mean, it's defined differently. It's not necessarily just high tech or brands or buildings. It's just redefining how things are used in a different way. Well, reusing buildings, I mean, adapting buildings yep. is... I, Inherently greener. Yeah. It's greener, but I, I just didn't think of it as high-tech cutting edge. I mean, it's you retrofitting. Can, I mean, it's, you can have a business that, you know, like you said, it, it, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't need to be, it could be a web developer or app developer, whoever, that just needs office space. It's, it's, it's you got to kind of open your mind up what cutting yeah, edge means. Yeah, different. It's not just technology, per se. I'm all about the risks. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you, get, you get the prize for reading the report. Standing <laughs> <laughs> Maybe calculate uh, risk. A pilot project or something. Well, I think, look, that's what I heard people talk about, and we do hit on that, which is it's calculate a risk, but there's a willingness to take a risk. And you know, the idea of this sort of like a, being a bit of a laboratory to, to try ideas, that, that got traction with people, so. Speaking of, you're talking about with the, the next generation and the, the students, uh, this would be a perfect thing for the next generation advisory committee to take a look at and give the feedback on to get their community. We have that built, that's literally why they're, they exist, is to take a look at things like this and give feedback to council. I, I agree 100% with you, Kyle. The, last, the first meeting I attended, they're really focused on doing some sort of town hall to get input on what they should be working on, and so this might help them with that process. Yeah, so that would be great. And I think <coughs> to someone on Steve's comments, you know, the, when I, you know, when I read through it, I'm like, it, look, it looks great. It's you know, there's lots, lots there. Um, at the same time, it kind of comes across as a little. Generic, superficial, you know, it doesn't dive deep into a whole lot of stuff, which is fine because you can get to a lot of these places. You don't want to be, this is, we're going to go after this specific industry. 
And so I think that's, it's a strength and a weakness here too. Um, some of the things like, you know, climate environment is, I mean, the word environment's there four times and it's all with built environment, not actual environment, environment, and things like that to kind of you'd be able to be able to pull the string on many different areas to get there. Because that's what you want to be, have a diverse business um, environment. Um, so don't want to see, you want to see everyone kind of be able to find their place in here. And we'll use this every year as we develop more specific plans and, you know, based on what we're hearing. Um, you know, I'm hearing a Littleton Boulevard, so I don't know, 10 years down the road or whatever. So we're attracting creative companies, architects, engineers, some quirky, fun businesses. So that are, you know, South Park becomes an environmental research hub or, you know, something like that. So, so we build out based on this foundation and each year we're, we're you know, planning in the shorter term to, to kind of get to those bigger, <coughs> bigger um, concepts. I like it a lot. I feel like the most important thing I heard was that as council we got to plan this corridor so that it doesn't get eaten up by developers. So that feels like the top priority to me. And I like this overlay, like the way that you're talking about historic preservation and the the way it can all work together, like for both sides, which often feel contrary. Any other comments? Can we take a break? Sure, yeah, good time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So, so next steps will kind of a little more tweak and refining go to next gen coming back to council for an adoption. If I'm assuming it'd be a, either a motion or a resolution to. Yes. Provide, since I know historically we councils have seen lots of plans and never done anything, never formalized them. And then that will be once it's, you know, adopted, that will be helpful in the revision of, or the redoing of the comprehensive plan. And then for other, you know, go out to businesses and show them with it and use for potentially getting other grant funds or things, you know, kind of along that, those lines. Yeah, and as we come back and do our departmental updates in the future, many of the elements that you're seeing in the SEDs will be highlighted. So we would report out on that specifically. Yeah, um, this is why we're doing it because it's in this plan. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for you, time. Time. Take a five minute break, four minute break.
intervene here with the last item is a, kind of a discussion about the land use code revisions and potential um, amendments. So, Thanks, Barry. So, yeah, the uh, ULUC and how our code matches up with council's goals for change and change and progress in the community um, is really kind of our 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 subject tonight and um, you heard earlier I think this was a good night for the community development economic development department department overview because you heard of a lot of the work happening and I think just to recap you've heard this before but we have I think of three major categories of work right now in, in community uh, development, uh, and those being that, you know, very high, probably highest priority is the uh, more than doubling of project workflow and staying on top of that, maintaining the, uh, you know, the that flow of projects and uh, economic development that we need so vitally. Also, though, we have this very you know, serious and uh, you know, now process that has legs that we call a design of the future where uh, our staff has committed time each week and you know, hours per week um, to making improvements that ensure that our process is getting better and that we have better, um, that you know, we're able to improve that and, as I say, keep putting our best foot forward with the community. This is the third leg of that kind of workload stool, the uh, ULUC updates and code amendments, which um, is a very intense, to do it correctly, it's a very you know intense effort and need to concentrate and spend time, dedicated time by our, our staff to move these changes forward. And the more complex, some of those policy questions uh, and the potential changes that they will be for the community. Our value here is, you know, community engagement, getting people involved, hearing from people, um, so the council has the benefit of all of that input when you make your decisions. Um, so you have, you'll hear about that ULC policy agenda as has been shaped by the council study session last fall where you where you kind of lined up some, some policy expectations and also a study session held in the last four to six weeks the joint session between your planning commission and your housing task force where there they uh, had had uh, had discussion that has made its way into this conversation tonight you'll have the benefit of just hearing kind of what some of those themes were for priorities from that group on um, policy changes to to advance housing and land use goals. So um, you know, tonight you'll hear about those kind of policy questions, and we're looking for your direction on priority to make sure that we can go off and and, and develop that, use our time the best. Also, you're hearing some different ideas tonight from staff about community engagement, and I'm not going to jump into that because they will. But kind of scaling our community engagement processes to the significance and complexity of the land use change that we're talking about. So we might be able to get more done with some of the more administrative changes um, without waiting for this large battery of changes all at one time at a later point in time. So with that, and with hoping I haven't stolen all of your thunder, Cindy and team, um, I would invite you to kind uh, of uh, to I think you framed the discussion very well. Um, so I, I don't feel like I need to add anything else. And I'll just refer over to Jared to kick off the discussion. All right. Thank you very much. Um, before you this evening, just uh, as a brief introduction, did want to go over. I know um, you got some introductions with uh, Cindy's prior uh, presentation, which we greatly appreciate. And we also want to recognize how much Cindy has um, really helped out the department here in the last few months. So she gave recognition to everyone else, and, and she deserves a lot of it uh, as well. So 
we like to thank her for that. But our team here this evening uh, comprises of um, myself as Jared Chipman as acting planning manager. We also have uh, Andrea Vaughn as uh, planner two and uh, Zreen Tazim, uh planner two as well. So our agenda uh, for this discussion is first to talk a little bit about process. So process of how um, the ULUC update was um, uh, uh, basically how we did it last year versus what we're proposing this year, which is a bit more of a thematic approach. And um, we understand that uh, initially there was a strong desire to have one large uh, update. We more or less want to still keep with a large update, but then also work on some smaller thematic things that Andre is going to get into a little bit more. Um, staff has identified uh, some priorities, and but we want to make sure that those priorities mesh with city councils, and that's really what we're going to be looking for this evening. We also want to just briefly touch on the 2024 uh, legislative session and just uh, uh, plan commission, or excuse me, <laughs> Uh, the planning department's uh, uh, plan to keep an eye on that session and to react to it if need be. And then lastly, as I mentioned, um, we're looking for direction from state council. We've provided three, uh, we'll ask you kind of three very pointed questions. Those are definitely just uh, not the be all end all, but they're there to frame the discussion. And so uh, we definitely wanted to provide a, a basis for that discussion to move forward. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Andre. Thank you, Jared. Um, well, Jim set us up so well, I don't know how much we really need to go into this. But um, so like Jared said, we did want to kind of discuss uh, process uh, and compare last year's to what we would like to move forward with this year. So last year, staff um, was given direction from council um, really on a broad range of topics. Um, and so after that direction was given, staff immediately went to uh, not only drafting the work, but also doing engagement and doing those simultaneously. So, you know, while staff is drafting, they're also asking for feedback and then doing those revisions and kind of going back and forth in that process. Um, and then we finally kind of got to that public hearing component. Um, for this year, what staff would is proposing to do is um, we recognize that you know last year's process certainly did work, but we think that there are ways that it can be improved on, uh, particularly in ways that do help our community understand what we're doing and what we're proposing a bit better. Um, so what you can see here on your slide is a potential new process that we would like uh, to use. And so rather than conducting these amendments as one large project, um, like Jared said, is find a thematic way of approaching this that allow, that gives staff more time to look into the code. Um, our code is relatively new, but there are things hidden in many different places. And so by having that opportunity to really do that code research, we're able to kind of find those areas that need amending. It also works better for our community engagement, where we're able to go to the community with one topic and look for feedback and kind of give it you know, present the ideas in a less technical way than had been done previously. Um, and in this process, what we're recommending is, is that, so staff and council both identify priorities. This meeting tonight is one of those examples of how we can do that. Um, and then we are proposing that staff then kind of go back, identify those goals and look for those relevant code sections, really develop a scope of work, uh, and then come back to council with uh, an authorization something that we can present to you all and receive feedback on that direction. Um, and actually, um, while we were in break, I did hand out um, just kind of a, a timeline for one of the thematic updates that we are proposing, the neighborhood housing opportunities. And this helps kind of, I think, provide a, a visual guidance for this process that we're proposing now. And just one question that might help to make it tangible. Um, the, 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 the authorization that Andrea mentioned, I think, would be an informed um, kind of give a little, a, a lot of flavor for the direction we'd be going for council so that you could have that early kind of check in, not only on just a topic like you might be seeing tonight, but actually what that code amendment could affect and do. So it's. Um, so that it's more kind of iterative with council and before getting out with the public engagement. So here yes. 
Thank you. So, and we just want to kind of touch back on that thematic mm -hmm. programming again, I, recognizing that it really does work better for staff's research as well as engagement. We think that we can get probably a more robust um, and really more, um, maybe more enthusiastic engagement from our community if we're able to come to them directly with a question or with an idea and then receive that feedback, uh, particularly on those uh, items that may not be as uh, technical. Um, so some of those, uh, you know, we have identified that there are some of those themes um, and we wanted to make sure that we also made mention here that kind of part of this thematic programming may also be in the code. There is already a provision for non-substantive amendments. Those are mostly just kind of uh, grammatical errors, but there's also some room in there um, for a city attorney to propose code amendments um, for those items that are deemed to be non-substantive. And then going through this uh, and trying to identify themes, we've also identified different levels for engagement. Uh, right now we're calling them our community updates and our technical updates. Uh, our community updates we envision having much more community feedback uh, and much more engagement that's required and because of those uh, because of that it'll require more it'll, those will run on longer timelines uh, so we have our neighborhood housing opportunities which we'll be discussing these uh, in more detail in further slides uh, but so our neighborhood housing opportunities as we're introducing tonight includes not only ADUs but also kind of opportunities for those missing middle housing stocks in our community as well as our historic preservation plan. Um, I would like to note here that we do have it on our schedule slated for 2024. However, um, that is really dependent on us uh, having a historic preservation planner and getting them onboarded up to speed and comfortable enough to start running with uh, code amendments and these plans. Uh, that also includes the certificate of appropriateness uh, process that I believe was identified in the last month as needing to be updated. Um, that planner, when they are onboarded, will be given direction um, to look at that process. Um, but then in our technical updates, those are, those are the updates that we don't think really require as much community engagement. We certainly want to have touch points, uh, but they're really much more, they're more minor. Um, so we have our planning and subdivisions. Uh, we've identified some errors uh, that do just need corrections. Um, and then I think possibly seeing soon. We have our nuisance ordinance, um, but also some other things like our temporary conditional uses, our three-mile plan, and then again, those non-substantive amendments. What's the three-mile plan? The three-mile plan is um, our... <laughs> it's the annexation. Deal with annexation. It's the annexation, yeah. Uh, so, uh, it's legally required to do. By, uh, by the uh, state of Colorado is directed uh, that state, that municipalities are to update that annually. Ours hasn't been updated since 2015. I don't think that there will be any major changes to it. Uh, have it. It's, our, it's an area of plenty oh, thank you. influence. It's the yes. land use. The idea in many communities, less, less uh, applicable here perhaps, but especially where there is annexation opportunity, you want to have kind of a plan for your three mile radius, how your land use policies could in, could influence affect um, that area, especially if you were to annex, less applicable here. It's like a just in case plan. Maybe. But we have to have one and it needs to be updated, so we want to do that. Is that fair? <coughs> that is much better than I did. <laughs> That was a very good summary. You can start helping out. <laughs> I googled it and I still was confused. Yeah. Thank you. And Thank you. with that, I think we're going to turn over the next portion to Zareen. So under community updates, we are grouping some topics together, together under what we are terming neighborhood housing opportunities. First is the topic of accessory dwelling units, or ADUs. Through the code amendment process last year, we learned this was a topic of great importance to council, and we are taking a much deeper dive into it this year, um, including looking at the current restrictive standards associated with it and some of the fee requirements as well. So how does this overlap to what the state's working on? 
So we'll be touching yeah, on that I'll, a little I'll, later. I'll get to that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Um, yes. As an outcome of that joint recent joint study session with Planning Commission and the Housing Task Force, we'll also be looking at other changes to the code that we will that we hope will be making it easier for the missing, quote unquote, missing middle housing opportunities arise. And the missing middle housing typically includes duplexes, triplexes, um, much more denser single family residential neighborhoods, for example. Um, we have also heard from the housing task force that they have a desire to create a pattern book for a variety of different housing types. Um, what that means will come out of sort of this discussion and what if that's something council would like us to pursue. Right. My understanding is that there's a pattern book for Aberdeen Village. Is that on your radar? It was created about 15 years ago, maybe 20. Yes, I'm not aware of that one. That's something that we would be happy to research though. OK, well, I don't want to derail you, but I think it exists. So sorry, keep going. Okay. Well, this would be more about citywide. Yeah, the pattern book would be for specific homes or things like that would be pre-approved, right? So we'll kind of expedite that. Right. Um, so speaking of that, I think back in November, we had talked to, as a council about trying to expedite the permits for the habitat homes that were being rehabbed. Um, so I don't know if this is a good place to maybe get an update on that or if this fits in with what we're trying to do um, to get those homes online faster. Better question, if I could, could, could get that back to you tomorrow, that, if mm -hmm. that would better because I'd, I'd like to have that to be as, as accurate and complete as we can. And Everyone that remember that conversation? Yeah, right, okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I, I that was a joke. That was meant to be okay. short, but I think, I think it, okay. the update could be, be longer than we want. <laughs> okay, my making sure that again, when we're talking about missing middle, that is one avenue that we've been working on with our housing authority, right, is to get more of those for sale homes online. And that is one thing we said, hey, as a council, can we expedite that somehow those that permit review process, because we were hearing from those homes that they were that's what they were waiting on. So okay, I look forward to that. That's a building component. There's a, a kind of a heavy building services component there too. So I want to make sure we have the right folks. Great, right, thank you. Yeah, and then, just as mentioned previously, the Historic Preservation Plan is on our radar, but unfortunately the update will need to occur once we have an actual planner in that position to kind of look at that. So as part of the technical updates, we're looking at the platting or subdivision process, including the decision criteria for preliminary plats. Staff is currently working with the city attorney's office to update our nuisance ordinance, which is actually located in Title Seven of the city code. Typically, um, planning is only in the Title Ten realm. Uh, per state regulations, as mentioned before, we'll be looking to update our three-mile plan, which informs the city's annexation process. Should any you know unincorporated properties come into our purview to want to be annexed within the city, and. Finally, we'll be making other minor code changes as well. And the home occupations cleanup there, is that talking about the uh, non-related residence occupancy conditions about uh, how many and who? Not, not so much on what you know makes up a family, et cetera. That's typically not what we look at in the home occupations. What, um, oh, home occupations. I, I misread it. Sorry. Okay. Occupancy, but. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, not. Okay. Uh, Never mind. I'm on the same page. Disregard. Just <laughs> so, okay. And just to speak to that, we don't define family within our zoning code. Is home occupied businesses? No, that's correct. Yeah. Oh, there's some. This is home occupied oh, businesses, anyway. correct? Yeah. 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 There's some other. There are, yeah. there are some other ways we define yeah, you're talking about who can live in a <laughs> residence. But. And most of the. Um, home occupation item that we're looking at is cleaning up language to make it a little more understandable and so that we're able to um, have clearer criteria. We, we find that a lot of the bullet pointed items are pretty sound and pretty solid. It's just um, trying to make sure that we were able to apply that to the, um, the table, et cetera, of use category. So we just want to make sure that that's a little clearer in, um, in the code. And this is going to get a little more technical and boring, but that's why this is in technical updates. But recently we discovered in the home occupation section, there is signage allowance for you can have, you can't 
have a sign. There's, there are three there's, different there's signs. There's areas. conflict with the signage you can and cannot have in the home occupation section, and then in the residential zone district sign sections about what signage you can and cannot have, and they conflict. So again, this is technical things, and that's why we're grouping it in the technical update. So we just want to make sure that the code sections all align and make sense. Well, and from our previous conversation just 30 minutes ago, Cindy, like I think looking at, again, home businesses and all the rules and regulations and things we can actually change that, again, other communities have done to foster, you know, that economic driver for small business, I think this is the perfect place to do that research and present those things, not just cleaning up those conflicts, but also looking at it as an opportunity to change um, to further the business and balance it with the needs of the neighbors who may not want a high traffic business in their neighborhood. And but Gretchen, are you recommending that they consider at some point moving that part out of technical updates and into the community engagement component? I think per their new process, yeah. I think that would be important. We'll have some more conversations with that. When we come back in this, that, yeah. this process, if, cal if council is supportive of, of the team coming back in a couple months when they've had a chance to kind of vet these further and actually give more of a flavor of what would be included um, that you can weigh in on. I, I think that's when we could kind of settle the community in, engagement strategy this is, question. This is, the, all you're asking right now is whether we agree to bifurcating the process, not which parts are bifurcated. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the that's a large part. That's question number one, and question number two will be: um, Do you have any other like really large updates or? We, we just want your input on that. But yes, bifurcating the process is absolutely one of the questions that we have for you. And I think the next slide will spark some discussion because one of the questions we're also looking for direction is in terms of priorities. So on this graphic shown here, it outlines a work plan that staff is currently proposing on how to tackle these updates while balancing our current staff resources and our department that I think Cindy highlighted well in our on the first presentation. On here, you'll also see other topics that have been highlighted that we haven't touched upon on this presentation, but have been identified as important through conversations with council and others that we have slated for future updates. Um, in the sheet in front of you, as Andrea had pointed out, it takes a closer look at that neighborhood housing opportunities block and what staff is proposing at a high level to achieve each quarter over the next year or so. What are design standards for which communities are you thinking? Yeah, so we're grouping things thematically. So design standards would encompass any sort of design standards. For example, there's been discussion of people wanting to look at transition standards within zone districts and between zone districts. So we're kind of putting that under the thematic arch of design standards. So these are more thematic approaches that we are trying to move forward with. And that's an example of one such item. So then um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, the religious. Littleton Boulevard overlay is until two, 2026. I mean, that's quite a ways away. Well, they have the, the historic preservation plan is up sooner here. So I think that needs to have that done first before you get into the overlays. That's that, kind of a sequence. That's a little that bit of what's going on in 2024. Don't you think they could move that up? I mean, there's nothing <laughs> there, really. <laughs> I, we definitely appreciate that, Mayor. That was our thought pattern as well, is that we would like to kind of have that historic preservation plan, which will also then uh, dovetail into exactly how we approach Littleton Boulevard. There is a section of the ULUC that has not been adopted, but has been drafted. So it's the, um, the uh, uh, mid-mod mile. And so we would like to take a closer look at that, um, potentially utilize some of that text, but yet make some updates to it in regards to what um, what uh, HP plan may have to say, et cetera. So, um, so there's been some good foundational work there, but we definitely want to um, make sure that, that that's still the case and how to bring it forward. What is the city plan? That would be the comprehensive plan update and planning will be hopefully taking a major uh, lead in that as well. So again, balancing that staff resources and considering how are we, which long range plans are we tackling? We just didn't want that to drop off the radar. Right. Uh, your 
five. It, it might be longer than, than just two years as well. Not not certain on that yet. So, um, so the the legislation legislative session um, in regards to that uh, staff has been um, attending meetings uh, just as uh, overviews of what is being proposed, trying to keep um, apprised of the situation and. Um, a lot of what they're discussing uh, includes ADUs, but also uh, what they're calling <coughs> TOC rather than TOD. We put TOD on here because I would feel it's a, a little bit better known term. But, uh, <coughs> transit-oriented communities is what the state has been um, uh, focusing on, which is uh, kind of density around transit centers and looking at um, housing there. So those are items uh, that we're, we're looking at. and. For one, one of the reasons why we bring that up is in the work plan, it's, it's really um, affected what we're proposing. So uh, one of the reasons why the work plan for housing, our neighborhood housing opportunities, is a little bit longer is uh, not only to implement the new system, but also to uh, allow us to be conducting research and still watching that legislative session so that we can hopefully be prepared to come back to you with items, but if something gets switched on us really quickly, we're hopefully better able to uh, react to that and then bring you a product. They change things too much once they introduce something that sticks pretty much at that, doesn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> anyway, we're, we're trying to set ourselves up for success. <laughs> so, um, but then also the... Um, you know, last year over the summer, we did the public engagement portion. Um, we do feel that summer is a, a pretty good time because there are some built-in events there and that uh, client staff attends those and tries to uh, to get some feedback from the community. And then that would um, result in more of that uh, drafting and finalization work uh, to come back to uh, Planning Commission and State Council. Um, one of the items that, that we want that we'll ask about here in the next slide, but we want your input on, is um, how much interest uh, City Council has in some of these other neighborhood housing opportunities, because that would equate to kind of this longer process rather than a more focused uh, process just based on ADUs. So that's that's going to be one of the um, one of the items that we really ask for direction on. Just to paraphrase or just to put a, a highlight on that, some conversation tonight that would be helpful is they've out, you know, the, the team has, has outlined several of these kind of policy areas, and that will take the time that's outlined here, we feel. If council wants to see us move faster on, say, ADUs, then that could probably be achieved recognizing that there could be some, some lengthening of the process for, for some of the other pieces. Um, that are on the list. So that's what we need your um, your thought. Like we had talked about finishing or coming back with it with uh, ADUs this year, this this fall. We could do that, um, but it would you know we wouldn't be able to do all of those those neighborhood housing pieces, which will take more research when it comes to the general de the gentle density strategies. Um, although we could do would take the longer time that you're seeing on this this sheet here so we we want to have and we'll you know I think in, in a few minutes Jared or Cindy can facilitate some of that conversation about trade-offs that we could that we could have so absolutely thank you so um, kind of our, our last si slide our summary um, and request for direction here uh, three main questions uh, is council supportive of staff's suggestion on you know, as as was mentioned, bifurcating that process and doing a thematic approach um, to code updates. Two is council support of staff's um, uh, recommendation to look at ADUs and kind of that missing middle gentle density um, as one community update item, one larger update item. And then three, um, are there other council priorities uh, that staff that you'd like staff to research? Sometimes those other priorities can potentially go into the smaller um, technical updates, but um, we're all ears when it comes to 
hearing priorities from council. We've heard a number from uh, plan commission, et cetera. And so we want to be cognizant of those and we want to provide the same opportunity for, for input here. Let me be clear about question one. In terms of grouping things together, to me that makes sense. Is that the community updates only or the technical <clears throat> or both? So the, the community updates really proposed to be um, kind of one larger item. So if we do decide to go with housing as, as a larger item, uh -huh. then that's something that we would prefer to look at um, in, in that community update. So the technical updates, if, if an item brought up we felt really fit well into one of our technical update categories, absolutely, we'd try to plug it in there and, and address it in that uh, update. Um, that's a little bit more uh, what our thought pattern was. So, um, so they're talking about broad categorization between community and technical. And okay. if we agree with bifurcating it to have staff focus on technical versus focus on these larger. You would see those technical items. things come back much sooner. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the last time it was all just one big. Not necessarily right. the content of yeah. either of those. But so the technical ones may be the same as or different than the community ones. They are different. Yeah. Different. Yeah. Would, right. Um, like the back. example you were giving of the signs are different yeah. in three different places. Right. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah, I think simplified is instead of doing one big update where you're looking at like hundreds and hundreds of attached pages right. you might be looking at. So, one. So, or so Pam, the, the, the dark orange ones are the community updates. The light yellow ones are the um, technical. Um, yeah. yeah. With the green. So what are the green? The green we talked about, it's more of a technical update that might need a little bit more community engagement. So we're still kind of... So and there's community yeah. updates that need uh, community engagement, some that cross over, and the technical ones you'll just bring back to us yeah. to look at, but that probably won't. That's, yeah, that's there's a engagement. lot more in their shorter time. Yeah. There's definitely a lower amount of, of process. There. And may not impact the community once you work on or may just for I think a great example is the platting item the platting item um, you know it is cleaning up a few things um, making it a little more streamlined I think if we built that into a large update kind of like we did last year we would you know lose people on understanding exactly what we're focusing on there and so we feel that that's something that can be a pretty streamlined, shorter process. Let's tackle that item and, and, and be able to move on to the next. Uh, that's really kind of what those technical items are, are uh, proposed to be. Well, May I suggest next time you put a key on this thing okay. so we know? <laughs> Thank you. No, that, that's understandable. Yeah. No, I, think it, I think I'm in favor of that. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm all the by anything to make your job. jobs easier. <laughs> well, we also want to make it more understandable. Well, I, 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 I have other things that make it harder. <laughs> yeah. Not anything. <laughs> <laughs> Stop asking questions. I think that was feedback that we got when we had the big 450 page kind of rollout. It was like stuff was, wasn't easily uh, digestible. Yeah, stick to the topic areas. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. Thank you, City Attorney. <laughs> <clears throat> journal entry again. Yeah, the, the two and three. Same with the big, same with two. Bigger yeah. questions. Mm -hmm. So, so it feels like you 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 um, framed the ADU conversation as serving two different values. One is the value of adding ADUs to our city, but the other value is being prepared for things that come up in the legislative session. Did I accurately understand that? And I, I is that right? Am I first of all? Yes. The, the, the legislation's uh, uh, the legislature will have done their work for this year uh, in time for us to dovetail that with what we bring back to you for as you know city policy as you know, city code uh, amendments. So we're watching and we're going to make sure that what whatever the state if there are state mandates or requirements that those are baked in so that we're consistent with those. Um, but I think there will still be, we'll want to verify with you that that, that's, uh, that that meets your policy goals for a little bit because you may want to go further than, this, than the state does. Right now, that's, that's why the team said they're, they're monitoring that. 
but the session will be over, you know, in three months. To answer yes and no, I mean, we, this was like regardless of what the state does, that's the council last year said we want to take a look at this. I mean, so it wasn't necessarily banking on the state doing something, it's just something that we want to do in the community. Yeah, the, uh, number two is more in terms of do you want to do it one at a time or? Correct. So we're looking for council direction of do you want us just focusing on ADUs and that's it, or this broader term of ADUs and other housing opportunities? So more speak direction on both that. sides of my mouth at the same time here because you know I think of having something tangible done earlier would be better, but all the with the some of the legislation that's coming out, they're looking at it together. Basically, they're not separated out. It's ADUs or I mean, what is the actual the language is? Oh, they close it somewhere. My understanding, I think about ADUs as, as, as brownfield, not brownfield, but existing development, development, where you're adding build, more buildings on land that's already been developed. Whereas missing middle, it's, it's either redevelopment or um, develop, you know, develop. It's like a two different problems. Mixing them. Mm, yes and no. I mean, you could take a, 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 a single family home and add an ADU, or you could take a single family home and uh, split it, make it into a duplex. Whether Do they it's, both allow for home ownership? Huh? The, well, the, 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 the actual use of them is separately done. That's up to, you know, code of saying, can you set up a parcel of an ADU? I mean, typically no, but it's kind of a different with the actual use of it. But to I me, think there's a priority on the missing middle. I saw that housing task force. I went to that planning commission <clears> presentation, <throat> and I feel like the missing middle feels more important personally, but I know I missed a lot of the. And I think with what I was getting at is I think having ADUs, it's easier to focus on that and get something tangible back, but the net benefit is so little because they're not being built, they're expensive. I mean, you, you, it, they sound good in theory, but you know, we've had, what, six in the last uh, year, and even if you expand out, I mean, it's not gonna be waves of things, whereas the missing middle and all the legislation, it flips it together as either accessory dwelling units or duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes. I mean, they, that's all kind of get lumped together. Yeah, I'd say the, the missing middle also has more possible impact on our community feel than ADUs and and feels like something that we have to chew on more. Well, I think that's one of the, the, the takes on that. He's looked at that. You can have, it does a 4,000 square foot house with a family of seven living in it have any more impact than two, you know, 1,500 square foot houses that have two families of three. I mean, that it, I, I don't necessarily agree that it, duplexes change the whole character. Well, I guess I'm leaning towards agreeing with Andrea that I, I think the missing middle conversation is going to take me a, a while to kind of chew through. And so separating them makes sense. To, prioritizing missing middle over ADU makes sense to me. So, so I will say regarding the ADUs, we, we don't allow them in all the right. various. Where the proposed legislation that we've seen, which is basically any place that's single family residential, you can have an ADU there. Right. That's not something that the city of Littleton has. We're Correct. not that broad. We're pretty narrow right now. And that's what the point of doing this is take a look at that to broaden it. You know, I, I mean, this is just me, the, the attorney. I think there's value in us exploring the ADUs as a city, if nothing else, than to be able to provide meaningful feedback to the state legislature when they're considering these preemption issues. And if we know what effect there is or what possible well if the if the legislature has combined both of them do we even have the bandwidth to prepare both of them it's it's not going to be immediate i mean there was a last time there was a ramp up of two or three years there's still going to be a ramp up period and so i'm not worried about that timeline with that i think are you saying separate them out do one first and then the other or talk about them yeah, at the same time. time no i mean but you know with adus it is kind of there is a part to the missing middle. Um, yeah, you know, depending on how you look at ADUs, is it a way to increase densification within certain residential areas to provide for, in theory, more affordability, more persons living in a location? So that kind of gets into that missing middle, other than it doesn't have the ownership aspect of you know, a townhome, but it is you know, another option for, for housing. Currently, the uh, ADUs are restricted to alley yeah. lots that have alleys. Okay, so that's fantastic. no. I appreciate that, and and six is pretty much zero. And that's specific yeah, to um, detached ADU. Yeah, that's detached. That's that's just different. Different. That's we different. allow contained and attached ADUs a little more broadly. Yeah. A lot of our restrictive standards related to ADUs are 
really specific to detached ADUs currently in our my, schools. My 12 year old son lives in a, a, a contained ADU in his own room. He just stays in that all the time. So, to your point, so they, are, they are expensive. Right. And yeah. the detached, yeah. yeah. A, a number of the phone calls that we've received as well are oftentimes from individuals that do have the larger lots <clears> um, because they tend to have a larger garage on it or they tend to have the space to, to build a, a detached ADU uh, and sometimes the means as well. Um, and at this point in time, they have you know, not been able to pursue uh, construction of an ADU. Um, so that is something that I think is one of the reasons why council at the time kind of wanted to take a, a deeper look at it. Um, we were intending to largely bring ADUs as, as kind of the community update, and then uh, got to uh, the Planning Commission and Joint Housing Task Force meeting and uh, asked them about some more priorities, and they really dove into the idea of, well, ADUs are great, but can we bundle it together and tackle, uh, or at least investigate, uh, the possibility of doing, making some changes around missing middle. Um, and then that also kind of dovetailed into the potential for the pattern book, which I can go into a lot more detail on that if, if you're interested. Um, but that's just to give you a little bit of background of as to why we're asking some of these questions and, and the direction we're looking at. That's where I'm, I think that would be more impactful for the city. The and community which would, do, what would be? To do them okay. as one, both yes, together one. as one. Because they, they do meet the same kind of At goal. least until we see where the state goes. Because the state may go further or, you know, not as far in one of those than the other. And council will be more comfortable, you know, could be more comfortable if the state, for instance, <coughs> says, if the state's... I don't want to do this in reaction to the state. I want to do it here. Okay. I, regardless what's, I mean, Fair if the state comes and says you have to do this, and we're like, well, we didn't incorporate that, then we got to change it. But I'm, I right. think this is what we got to do for Littleton and not. So what you're saying, you'd rather have our own policy mm -hmm. and then dovetail it where we need to with the state as opposed to the other way around. Correct. Yeah. And I think, I mean, they'll be over in May. I mean, we'll know where the, the bills went. They're not, they are not going to have this done by May, right? No, and that's... I mean, you, if you can, reason. feel free to. Feel free to if you want. That's why, and, and to be honest, that's one of the reasons why we feel it worked, the schedule kind of works the way it, it potentially could work out really well, is that it allows us to still move forward, do our own research, but at the same time, if we do need to react, instead of, you know, waiting for that that three year uh, implementation, two to three year implementation period, shoot, we might be ready a lot earlier than that because we've started that process. I think I agree with Kyle lumping it together. I think community engagement is so difficult to organize and uh, digest all the information. To put it together, those two topics makes sense mm -hmm. from that perspective. Yep, I agree. Got a lot of yips. Yep, 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 yep. Fantastic. Um, like, isn't that a that's what I was getting at. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Um, can you remind us the timing then for that? Is you, are you thinking summer or spring? I know when we talked about ADUs, it was going to be early spring oh, so that we would have that. So, but this sounds like we're adding more research to have to help it be a little bit more. Yeah, no, of, so. of, of 25. Not of like in a few months here. Well, for ADUs, when we talked about it at the end of last mm -hmm. year, we had said we would bring that conversation forward this spring. So it sounds like you're pushing back that timeline so it can be more comprehensive around missing middle. Yeah, so if, and if I'm not mistaken, or my, if my memory serves me well, um, at the end of last year, we talked about doing it within the next update, and the next update was a full annual update. Um, yeah. So we started this conversation in the spring, but yep, it's just going to continue on for okay. precisely. Okay. So when are we going to see... Something. This this is what the process would look like if you have you oh. can walk through it, but if you want to have a look. Okay. That's what I'm And if you can kind of overlay that timeline with the can't chart, can't disk chart. Yeah. We could go back to that. That's no, no problem. Oh, that's, um, that's, thank you. But also um, we would still come back yeah, under what we're proposing as well, the kind of the new process, we would also come back uh, to you with uh, an authorization and that would have more detail and much more detailed plan for engagement as well. And still have that, hopefully, just finalized Scope of work so you can that's, come back and say, Council, you haven't changed your mind, this is what we're right, going to do. You're okay April. with that, right? Okay. And, well, and, and also that the task force has done some of that heavy lifting. They have done some research, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we can uh, 
consult them as well and and uh, further discuss the feedback we received here. And I think everyone kind of council forgets that they're still doing all the other planning work with everything else that's coming in, all those permits that we saw. So it's not like this is all they're focused on for mm -hmm. that year. It's going to take a year. It's going to. Is now a good Chip time away. to ask for a supplemental appropriation? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yes. <laughs> uh, what all? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, and then lastly, we also wanted to uh, inquire about any other priorities that council may have. We're also more than happy to take input after. You know, this is definitely not your only opportunity to um, to provide input on priorities or items of the code that have come to your attention. I think this is a good representation from the previous council's discussion based on our last year's retreat of the council priorities. And that's why, how, I mean, housing was that huge priority. That was the number one. That's why those are there. And you know, you see, if you look down in 2027, um, you see the uh, you know sustainable landscaping and you know things like that that are also priorities, but it was just the We've got to stack them and we can't do everything. We, I'm sure we would all love all those things to be done and come back in June and be ready to go, but we can't do that, right? Is that what, that's what I'm hearing? Right. So we put more staff? about one of the, the larger pieces, which is the historic preservation plan and the little Boulevard overlay. You know, I, and again, this is just posing a hypothetical, so I'd like to hear everyone's kind of reaction to it, but you know, based on what we know, we saw with the economic development folks, knowing that that's one of our primary transit corridors, primary drivers for economic development, but I will also say too, transit-oriented development, that Wilton Boulevard and Broadway Nexus is also aligning with a, you know, bus rapid transit studies and things of that nature. There's so much happening right there. I personally wouldn't feel that doing the Littleton Boulevard work with a deep historic preservation lens to it also inclusive of transportation, housing, economic development, but really having it be a mid-mod mile overlay, you know, like serious study on Littleton Boulevard. To me, it feels like the, the timing is more appropriate to even tackle that first Obviously, the historic preservation plan overlay, there's going to be so much of our city, a lot of the residents, single family residents, you know, iconic businesses, um, you know, commercial buildings that we would want to preserve. All well and good. I don't think anything we would put into a Littleton Boulevard overlay would necessarily contradict what would ultimately come into a historic preservation plan. Um, I don't see them conflicting, right? And so if I had my druthers doing the Littleton Boulevard overlay, I think would be almost a more meaningful pursuit now rather than later because of all the economic development and transit oriented development opportunities that are we are right on the cusp of. And it's been in the pipeline for so long. We've talked about mid-mod mile for a long time. I think it would also be very tan tangible and meaningful rather than just a broad plan. Do we have any sense. applications in for some development on Littleton Boulevard right now that you're aware of? Not currently. We okay. have some under construction some and completed. We have some time, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, you're, but what I heard you just say, and tell me if I'm wrong, is you're recommending kind of what was raised earlier was essentially doing the overlay first and doing the plan second. Flipping it. Flipping it. Flipping it around. And like I said, I not to say that the Littleton Boulevard overlay would be without historic preservation planning components of it. In fact, that would primarily drive a huge portion of it. But I just think the opportunity is more ripe to focus on it because of what we've heard from economic development, because of all the transit opportunities that are going to be coming up. So... I think you raise a really good point because that normally you do a larger plan and then do the sections. That makes sense. Um, but given that that's so far away and that we could see more redevelopment not in tune with the kind of the atmosphere or the flavor that we've talked about here tonight, um, I would support that. And then we could see an accomplishment. I'd say let's let's get through our planning, our, our retreat, see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. Good 
if, if, the list of priorities. If, if council's direction from there is similar to what we're hearing tonight, we could come back to you just like we're kind of seeking, we're, we're seeking what we're calling an authorization. Um, it's a for further vetting of the work, hang some more, you know, concepts on it, bring that back. I think, you know, in a few months, once our new staff is situated and once we are kind of better oriented there. But I'm, I'm, I'm hearing that and I'm, I'm seeing, I don't know, heads not on a, on a kind of a priority for, for Littleton Boulevard in our Patrick thinking and no. planning? No. Okay. I mean, seeing it in this context, um, unless there's another FTE that we approve to do that work, I don't see that happening. I would be interested in that, but, um, you know, that's... He's just talking about flipping the just flipping overlay and historic preservation plan and just moving them, prioritizing I'm them. I'm ambivalent. Members. I'm, I'm happy to engage in that conversation, but I'm, I'm, I'm in biblical. I, I mean, I, I, I hear what she's saying, and I mean, in theory, I like, but also what Pam said, you know, have the bigger picture plan, and then the smaller one ties into that. I don't know what is, I mean. Well, I, I think that's right. I, that's maybe not right now, but that's at the, the retreat. Yeah, we've got a lot of priorities coming up as we all expressed our yeah. concerns to Heather. I think it was Heather. Yeah. Um, so I said, I said, let's get through the retreat, and then, then let's see where this plays out. <laughs> so the, yeah, I, yeah. The additional issue that I have is what I brought up in the prior conversation is thinking a little bit more about buffers between our different um, zones. Um, I think I've had uh, constituents raise those issues with me, and I think the Cherry Cricket is an example of that. And I think we need to be more thoughtful about buffers. I think that comes into just the, the, the grind of the going through that process. Right. I'm just expressing uh, the priority for me. Of, Part of this process. I, I, I agree with you because I hear about the cherry cricket issue a lot too. In order, and I think we're going to have the same issue with the, the brewery down the street. Before we have another cherry cricket or whatever, and it and cherry cricket is fine, they redeveloped the cherry crest or whatever it, it, whatever it used to be called. I, I think we, we need to think ahead instead of reacting. And that's part of this, and I don't know if that's the historic preservation part or the overlay part or just permit parking or well, and I, whatever I, it is. But I want to, but I, there's two different, the buffer issue, there, there's the Littleton Boulevard issue of how do we manage possible increased density on Littleton Boulevard. But I also, as a bigger picture, am concerned about buffers for other parts of the and, city as well. And I think we're both diving into the weeds on that because that that's going to be a part of at all. I mean, it's part of the the housing of the ADU thing. That's all I would imagine be part of. It. So yeah, I don't think we need to have that discussion tonight. I don't know. I think no, things I, are a little different. I think commercial development uh, and how do you buffer the current? I, I understand that. I'm saying those are going to be part. I'm mean, just saying two things that are going to be part of this process that uh, that's this whole big process of how the community's going to the community's going to be a part of this they're going to say that so we don't need to have that discussion tonight i'm not worried about that being we do we do excluded. appreciate you making those comments though as priorities that you're looking I, for i want you guys to know the first time i've been on the council there's someone said they appreciated my comment <laughs> and so i've got a new friend on we all staff. thought it huh? yeah. we all thought it uh, <laughs> hey siri remind me to tell robert i appreciate him in four months <laughs> so so we can maybe put this as part of the priorities of the uh Tell your phone to Nothing, uh, just wait for it, Robert. What? I missed it. Kyle's phone was complimenting you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, yeah, we're, we're not looking for an in-depth discussion, but we are looking for, for kind of bullet points to look at. So, yeah. yeah. I'm curious, maybe this isn't the place to ask, but on the further research question, it feels like an important piece of missing middle are our manufactured housing communities, and I don't know how that fits into our plan. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little nervous about that getting squeezed out, or I don't, I don't know. <laughs> there that's part of the, there. Yeah. Good point. That should be part of it. We've certainly had discussion about uh, wanting to kind of explore that as a possibility, and that would definitely be a part of our, our research and case studies. Is manufactured housing the same thing as mobile housing, or are we talking about no. different things? No, so pre, pre, prefab, basically. I, I, I just needed to clarify. And, you know, factory built. And speaking of <coughs> innovative, you know, before you talk about you know, 3D printing of housing is something that's on the horizon. For real? Yeah. yeah. <coughs> not just prefab. But yeah, not just prefab, but actual 3D. I mean, it's... it's on the horizon. Oh, oh, it's to the but things housing. like that, you know, those Earth are things that we'll talk about. Suddenly we're a cutting-edge city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. 
We're gonna take this. <laughs> taking this to the movies. <laughs> <laughs> these are the, I think these are the kinds of comments just yes. that are gonna help us to flesh out this research and bring it back to you. So this is all helpful. You know that's my. Yeah, you we're, know that's we're my glad dream, to know right? that that's an item that you're interested in. I think that will play into making sure our building code aligns with our building code. That's a direction we want to move. Any other yeah. <laughs> priorities and things, you know, that we're seeing the... Like I said, I think we're going to hear a lot of, you know, data thing or sure. anything specific. That I just want to make sure this Littleton Boulevard HP plan gets resolved somewhere along if it's at the retreat. It's not at the retreat mm -hmm. someplace else. Like Wherever. These, we'll come back to you with a little more flesh with okay. what that means and what the... Put some more texture to that... Perfect. That choice Thank for you. And if you Thank can't you. hire a historic planner, it feels like a moot question. Yeah, and they, well, they may have the input. name's already published there, so. Uh, uh, it's I, coming. I feel like if I we was we need to give them a house, house to live in. Like, <laughs> is this like the, our housing policy is fine? On the internet, so it has to be real. Exactly. Yes. Great. Anything else in the council room? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, y'all. Yeah. Boy, thank you. Any, uh, so, <laughs> yeah, update so from the city manager. Thank you. I do have one. Uh, one that's yeah. I think uh, I responsive to what staff heard from council at your last week's at your your last city council meeting. Um, I've certainly heard from a from a majority of city council members um, an interest in hearing some uh, some planning on how we could accelerate the. Um, infrastructure components of our bike and ped planning um, to, to see some uh, prototype temporary experimental uh, demonstrations of how we could do things differently out in the field sooner. And you know, staff has really put their heads together this week on how we could do that and offer kind of that kind of that all that alternative schedule, what some of the trade-offs could be. We'd like to come back to you on February 6th, um, even faster than I thought we could. Um, staff will be ready at that time to actually outline some of those uh, capital project temporary installations and things we can do along the infrastructure vein uh, more quickly than we had thought we could in the first place. So we want to come back to council, talk about what the trade-offs will be. I think, you know, it, it will involve uh, some more direct discussion with council without quite as much community engagement as uh, the plan that we had arrived at a couple months ago had had envisioned. But that's what the study session will, will, be, will be, be, be for, to talk about how we can move those ahead faster um, what that might mean. So we'll have that information. I know we're also putting more detail on the plan and I know we've already had uh, uh, enhanced speed enforcement and other traffic enforcement from the, the police department. Our communications team with the schools has been putting plans and materials together that will be shared on that front too. Um, I've heard the question about more detail on all of that, so we'll have that all for you on February 6th. That's our plan. You'll have an email to this effect, but in case we have public watching, I wanted to get that word out that um, we've, we've heard that interest, and we'll have that conversation for council on the 6th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, great. I just Thanks. want to remind Council tomorrow night, uh, Representative Crow's having this town hall here at, I think, 5.30 is when it starts. But he's not going to be here, right? He's going to be here. Oh, yeah. He's, he's not, not coming to the Beamer's oh, library. Yeah, there's, oh, staff, no, there's no. other ones that staff is doing at the, is the library. Uh, Friday morning is the South Metro Chamber Economic Forecast Breakfast. I don't know how many people are signed up for that. Littleton Meet has their grand opening on Saturday over on Todd yeah. Canyon and Bowles. And then... Uh, you don't care about my dinner. And Tuesday is a uh, Lone Tree's State of the City um, Tuesday morning before our council meeting. So. And it's the fifth Tuesday, and so yeah, there's, there's no, no council meeting. meeting. There's yeah. no meeting next week. Yeah. No meeting next week. So. Thank you. I would have been here. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then on the it's on the thirty first is and the uh, town hall art center <laughs> gala or not gala the donor appreciation dinners. Yes, sir. Kyle, Jared, once. Yes, sir. I just also wanted to bring up. I 
if I'm not mistaken, I don't have all the details off the top of my head, but on Thursday, I believe there's a root and renew um, virtual um, town hall. It's the first, it's the first uh, community engagement. engagement piece. Uh, open space and master plan update. Yeah. Calling it root and renew. Yeah, can you send us details on that? Virtual state 530 virtual. Uh, uh, Jim sure can probably better yes. send you CMO's office as leading the effort for the approval of new green. Well, oh, it, it's not our city. It is our city, city. but uh, CMO's we office is leading the effort. We can on getting you information to be sent to us. Oh, yeah. The, what is root and renew different than open space master plan? Nope. It it's, it's the name for it. It's the catchy marketing <laughs> name that we're using for that plan. So it's the CML involved. CMO or CML? She said CML. City Manager's Office. She said CML. I'm going, what's CML doing with our open space? Pam, I'll call you. Got it. I'm going, what? City Attorney, any update or report? I was just going to talk about root and renew. 530. Five you can send it to us, that'd be good. It's a new vision plan for Elizabeth Parks, open space, and trails. First community meeting. The city manager's office will send you a, <laughs> <laughs> a link. All right. All right, thanks. We're adjourned. Thursday.